morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the European Security Forum 2021 edition. We are Sheila Becker, Vice President of Women's Cyber Force, and Desiree Alegre, uh, Secretary General of Women's Cyber Force. And we are your Masters of Ceremony for today, European Security Forum. Uh, in case you don't know, Women's Cyber Force is a young association uh, that is dedicated to promoting the role of women in the field of cybersecurity. Our vision is to build a strong ne network of confident, connected, and passionate female uh, professionals in cybersecurity, contributing to a society where female leaders are not seen as the exception to the rule. Our mission is to connect and support women who aspire to a career in cybersecurity. Therefore, we develop a capacity build capacity and uh, mentorship programs for entry, upskilling, and reskilling of in, in the field of cybersecurity. We also provide a trusted peer-to-peer -peer network in order to share knowledge and to um, expand our uh, professional network. We also focus on raising our public awareness on the importance of gender equality in the cybersecurity field. And of course, we also want to promote women's cyber force at a national and international level. So what a pleasure it is for us to finally welcome you physically here at the European Convention Center in Luxembourg for this one day event dedicated to cybersecurity. Um, I would also like to welcome all the digital attendees uh, who will follow this unique uh, conference uh, remotely. Uh, during this event, we will welcome cybersecurity professionals and recognize experts of the sector. And to officially launch the e event, we are pleased to welcome Pascal Steichen, CEO of Security Made in LU, which is the structure behind the three main initiatives um, for information security, which is Circle Cases, and um, be secure. So, Pascal, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to European Cyber Security European Security Forum. Sorry, <laughs> um, here at the ICT Spring Fair 2021. It's a pleasure to meet again in person to uh, talk, network, exchange, best practices, and see the latest developments uh, that have been done by all of you, and uh, address the common future challenges together. At least, I would say, work together, speak together to, to see how we can address, address all these. Cybersecurity is, for many, still a quite cryptic topic, although and many reports and analyses uh, show it, cybersecurity has become the main topic of many boards, of many companies, even individuals and states worldwide. This is not only due to the pandemic, um, where we have faced or we have um, really felt the technological dependence that our society has today, uh, technological dependence in the sense of the digital tools, the digital platforms that uh, we use. It was great that we could use them so that I would say the economy could continue, but still during the pandemic there were a lot of uh, issues that has raised and showed that this is really a dependence. So the um, cybersecurity becomes really an important pot topic to make sure that these digital platforms are stable, secure, and future-proof. However, this, I would say, evolution in the many, many new, more incidents and, and things happening that you can read in, in, in the press or that you, that you hear, is not only due to the specific pandemic situation, at least that's what we see, have seen or, uh, and still continue to see here in Luxembourg. It's already, I would say, ongoing since, since a, few, a few years, especially due to the very huge efforts and movement of digitization that is going on in companies, in, in, uh, in states, and which is really covering all the, all the sectors. So a lot of sectors are discovering digital technologies and, I would say, face the issues with um, doing it the right way. Because cybersecurity, 
And allow me to, to quote uh, a colleague, uh, chairman of the ISC Square Bellix chapter, Emmanuel Case, who said cybersecurity simply means doing ICT the right way. And that's what we should do together in the, in the future. AI, cloud, IoT, all these, I would say, fancy topics that, that we hear that we, uh, we want to use to enhance our performance, to create new opportunities also for business, are very promising. That's a good thing. Um, but, but, yes, there is a but. We should do it the right way. We should include cybersecurity as of the beginning. Security by design, uh, privacy by design, all these elements are really crucial, quite important uh, today. Another common challenge that we all face already today and even more in the future, we as a cybersecurity community, is to make sure that we have the available capacities, that we have the available competences to make these new developments in AI, in cloud, in IoT, and all the other buzzwords that you can imagine and that you hear around all day, to make sure that all these are tackled, that we uh, are ready to face the emerging threats and really can take advantage of the opportunities that the technology uh, brings. Many recent developments also at the European level address already these uh, key challenges. Uh, and allow me to mention only two of them, which I think in the very new, new future will, um, you will hear a lot, a lot more of them in the next months. I'm sure of that. Uh, first of all, the very newly created European Cybersecurity Competence Center in, 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 in Bucharest. It's being set up at the moment. Uh, which will really bring, which is, I would say, an, 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 a new element in the puzzle and which really help develop the European cybersecurity community. So that, I think that will be a huge, uh, a huge development and is a real need for the, for the economy. Another very interesting development, and um, we have two representatives from Luxembourg here, is the Women for Cyber Foundation, where Women Cyber Force is the Luxembourg chapter. So this is, there is a European initiative and all the countries have their local chapters uh, to really also ad address this, I would say, human gap that we have. We have not enough women in cybersecurity, so happy to have at least two of them on stage all day. That's, that's great to see. Uh, but I'm sure Ms. Dispina Spanu uh, will sure give you a lot more insights about European developments and I'm very happy to have uh, to have you <laughs> uh, with us today. Uh, welcome, and I'm looking forward to your, to your keynote. Looking at the remainder of the program, many more topics obviously uh, will be presented from key experts from Luxembourg and abroad. It's really worth to follow the European Security Forum here in the room or uh, from wherever you are outside on the online, on the online channels. European Security Forum is also part of the National Cybersecurity Luxembourg brand. Uh, this local initiative uh, that really, I would say, brings together the ecosystem and um, where we created recently a new website called cybersecurity-luxembourg.com where you can discover the whole ecosystem where we have today 319 companies active in cybersecurity 32, uh, 38, sorry, public entities and nine civil society organizations. Quite an, quite an evolution uh, when we look back at, at, at uh, the last years. So dear all, I wish you an interesting conference, very fruitful networking, and without further delay, um, I would like to do a little introduction of, of uh, my long-term colleague and friend, François Thiel, Director of Cybersecurity at the Ministry of Economy and Chairman of Security Made in Alou for the opening address. Since 20 years, François is Luxembourg's key personality in cybersecurity, and it's really difficult to imagine an event without him. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal, for the nice introduction. 
and we are honored to have uh, the participation today of Francois Till. So uh, please, uh, the Director of Cyber Security for the Ministry of Economy, as already mentioned. Um, so give a warm welcome to the one and only Francois Till. <laughs> Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'm very happy to, to uh, address this audience. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear Despina, I think she's online, I don't know. Is she coming physically? Dear Sheila, Desiree, Pascal, Luc, all my all the friends and colleagues I meet on a daily basis, dear online audience. As Director of Cybersecurity and Digital Technologies, I have today the honor to represent the Ministry of the Economy. I am greatly pleased to address today's international audience, as well as our Luxembourg cybersecurity community on the occasion of the European uh, Security Forum. Indeed, a community we are. The booths at the International Cybersecurity Forum in Lille, or at the ITSA in Nuremberg, but most prominently at the ITC ICT Spring and the Luxembourg Cybersecurity Week demonstrate this effectively. The Luxembourg ecosystem, cybersecurity ecosystem, is a strong factor of attractiveness of our economy. Collaboration, affordability, accessibility are key objectives when defining our national cybersecurity strategy, developing infrastructures, our ecosystem, services, and products. The European Digital Innovation Hub, EDIH, supports companies to find cybersecurity services and products within the Luxembourg ecosystem or within its European network, re respectively. The EDIH also promotes the services provided by Luxembourg companies in this European network. The Directorate General for Foreign Trade and Investment within the Ministry of the Economy of the economy supports the ecosystem members to participate to trade missions and specialized conferences abroad and attracts companies to Luxembourg with the help of the LTIOs, the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Offices, and Lux Innovation. To enhance cooperation amongst cybersecurity actors, Lux Innovation and Security Made in Alu created a dashboard representing our current national ecosystem. 319 companies, of which 90 are fully dedicated to cybersecurity and staffed with 944 employees, of which a large majority is men. Cybersecurity is one of the many domains that suffer greatly from the absence of women. This is why I warm-heartedly welcome Women Cyberforce, an initiative I am a proud member of. Dear Despina, Shaila, Desiree, and every woman involved in cybersecurity, you are making a difference in our economy by contributing to the change of the traditional mindsets and helping transforming stereotypes that have been causing inequalities and injustices for ages. Thank you for acting as role, role models and actively promoting female skills development in cybersecurity and STEM professions. Merci. Cybersecurity is a perfect example to demonstrate the importance of our data innovation strategy. Technical security is about implementing tools that are capable of either detecting or mitigating threats respectively of reducing their potential impact. Technical security must continuously adapt to an ever-changing list of vulnerabilities and threats. The common approach is to use tools that scan, that scan for known threats. It is exceedingly difficult to integrate malware signatures or indicators of compromise into these tools in good time. If, one, if, on the one hand, these descriptions, description patterns are not available, cyber attacks may stay undiscovered for a long time with devastating effects for the economy. On the other hand, an over-excessive security 
is likely to disrupt licit business processes, also causing huge negative effects. Skilled cyber criminals exploit this dilemma to counter their deeds. High professional forensic specialists and threat hunters put in place complex security processes, collecting, storing, and analyzing network logs. Indicator of compromise are gathered and curative measures are implemented. This type of threat and vulnerability data should be shared among a responsible and skilled cybersecurity com community or ecosystem. In sharing information, a number of redundant work can be avoided. This is of great importance as there are only few highly skilled experts available in this field. Either we share or we lose the technical, technological race against the ever faster developing threat actors. Cybersecurity definitely is a data economy. Luxembourg invested early in information sharing platforms. Most of you might have heard of MISP, few are about AIL, and, and very few about D4. In my personal view, the sharing of threat and vulnerability data seems the only sustainable way forward. Why allocate huge efforts in work that is redundant when there is a possibility to share it? High quality cybersecurity services are too expensive because of a waste of money, time, and efforts in deeds that could be mutualized. As a consequence, many of our SMEs have to rely on unattended, automatic technical security solutions that work with signatures and indicators of compromise that are often out of date. Let us keep in mind that the vast majority of European companies are SMEs. They are strategic actors in the large supply, chain, supply chains. They play a key role in building inclusive and resilient societies. Often they handle critical data, including trade secrets, intellectual property rights, or privacy data. We cannot continue to provide cybersecurity services only to the wealthy part of our economy. SMEs deserve high quality yet affordable cybersecurity solutions. Based on the available information, available threat information, we are, must create cybersecurity services and tools that withstand the current magnitude of attacks. Therefore, the Ministry of the Economy has the intention to launch a cybersecurity data space as well as a new data exchange platform, which will be complementary to the existing platforms like MISP, AIL, or D4. This data space should also be open to any expert having a legitimate interest. Intense collaboration and exchange of data will not only provide the basis for the development of new tools and services, but it will also feed research and increase the level of sovereignty of European companies, products, and services. To kickstart this development, Luxembourg participates to the important project of common European interest, Cloud Infrastructure and Services, IPCI, CIS. Hello, Despina. <laughs> With the help of state aid, Luxembourg companies will be able to innovate and develop highly collaborative tools for cross-border cloud incident response and manage security services for the cloud. They will put in place the first cybersecurity data space and define the governance and data governance principles of the new data exchange platform. This will promote GDPR compliant exchange of data and foster research in the area of cybersecurity with the help of the national Cybersecurity Competence Center. Ladies and gentlemen, cybersecurity is a complex process. It obviously cannot be reduced to the acquisition and implementation of tools or the consumption of services. Cybersecurity also involves all aspects of human interactions and, of course, is a process that needs planning, prior prioritization, and resources. 
because costs are involved, companies need to prioritize their investments through a proper risk management where risks are identified and ranked according to their criticality, companies are able to do exactly this. Risk management is ba main, basically the main tool for cybersecurity governance on a corporate and a national level. However, the lack of good threat intelligence has a negative influence on the re reliability of risk management. Risk management based on assumptions then, rather than on thorough threat intelligence results in subjective decisions. Companies thus run the danger to spend a scarce budget on risk treatment measures that have been identified by flawed processes. If risk management is meant to serve good governance, also called informed governance, it must be based on factual information. Threat and vulnerability on information already available on our data exchange platforms, as well as information to be gathered in the cybersecurity data space, will help us as an ecosystem and a data economy to generate this data. This will improve the effectiveness of our risk management and, of course, our governance. Dear guests, the last aspect I would like to address today is the human factor. On the one hand, cybersecurity awareness raising and training continues to stay <clears throat> an important aspect of adopting the right behavior to cyber risks. This is addressed via multiple channels already, and I take the opportunity here to mention BSecure and uh, the upcoming European Cybersecurity Month in October organized by the European Commission, ENISA, and the member states. Human behavior is like a muscle. It needs to be trained in order to expand. Importantly, yet still too rarely, rarely addressed, is on the other hand the aspect of communication with top management and the responsibility of top management. Considering the potential dramatic impacts of cyber incidents, considering the accountability principle of GDPR, and due to the NIST directive, cybersecurity must reach level, priority level on a manager's agenda. I wish for our companies to achieve a culture of cybersecurity governance invol involving top management. When during a crisis, communication between Department managers, CISOs, CIOs is failing, is failing due to their respective specialized vocabulary. Good decision making is impossible. Cybersecurity is transversal across economic sectors and company departments. For this reason, I value all the people involved in cybersecurity within the government, the public, and private sector. That collaboration and cooperation is building our great growing ecosystem. I am confident that the European Security Forum today is a perfect opportunity to further strengthen our bonds nationally and at the European level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thiel, for being with us today and for this enriching contribution. Let's go ahead with our first session dedicated to the theme, Data Security, Everyone's Business. Our first speaker is Head of Cabinet for European Commission, Vice President Margaritis Ginas, and founding member of Women for Cyber, overseeing the European Union's policy on security, migration and asylum, health, skills, education, culture, and sports. She has come to share an overview of the EU Security and Cybersecurity Union strategy. Please give a warm welcome to Mrs. Despina Spino. Good morning, and thank you very much. Um, I have uh, 
just arrived from Brussels, where uh, everyone in the European Commission is watching today what we call the State of the Union, so the annual state of play of the President of the European Commission in front of the European Parliament, uh, talking about where we are and where we're going for the next year. So I spent the last two days, like many of my colleagues, trying to figure out what the secret is. So what will the President say today? Uh, so we haven't slept much because we were trying to dig in. Uh, we all wanted to know in advance. Uh, and I got one very relevant piece of information also for you. So while we're talking here, the President is talking at the same time. And uh, she is announcing initiatives for Europe to strengthen further cybersecurity, our cybersecurity capacity, our cybersecurity defense. So uh, I'm very happy that I'm able to share this here with you in this opportunity of this very big convention and conference in Luxembourg. Uh, also a country where you have done a lot to bring together forces in um, cybersecurity, to join uh, a lot of different aspects of the ecosystem, an example that, as you know, we now follow in the European Union. What I wanted to do is to um, do a little overview with you on where we are uh, in security in Europe. Cybersecurity for us being now uh, an integral part of security, not something that stands alone, but something that is a very substantive part of what we call the security union. The security union is a concept that came forward after a very big fight. And this is very relevant for cybersecurity as well, for every security, because security was always a, a very close kept secret for every member state. It was not something where we had a European Union policy. It was something where member states were deciding alone for themselves and uh, keeping the information mostly to themselves and very close to their chest, uh, dare I say. But back in 2016, with terrorism hitting uh, Europe's door in many member states, and with the uh, beginning of what we now have as a digital single market of connecting our systems, we realized that if you have an internal market of a number of member states, 27 today, it is important that you also connect their security. And this is when the concept of the European Security Union was born. But the actual strategy for the security union that was adopted for the first time was done under the von der Leyen Commission in July 2020. And as you see here, it is like a, a Greek temple. Myself being Greek, I, I kind of like these constructions. Um, so it, it is basically a strategy that encompasses everything meaning from tackling evolving threats, and these come both uh, from digital uh, information systems, but also from the physical world, the traditional threats, but that keep changing. Going to cyber crime, of course, organized crime, these two being now becoming even more uh, linked than ever. Uh, countering current and modern threats, like illegal content online. Um, uh, we now have a regulation in the European Union in this area. How do we deal with hybrid threats? That's also part of our security. Most threats, even cyber attacks now, become of a hybrid nature, meaning that they hit in a digital way and they have an impact on the physical aspects and or the other way around. Uh, also dealing with terrorism overall, the usual terrorism agenda. We adopted the counterterrorism agenda at the end of last year, but also strengthening the industrial capacity for cybersecurity in Europe, starting from research and innovation, but also going uh, through sectors. Our president is right now about to announce in the State of the Union uh, the proposed uh, creation of a European CHIPS Act. CHIPS, not the way the Brits mean them, but um, the CHIPS. That you know, for those of you who understand the business. And those who laughed, though, understand. This is because we want to strengthen the area of semiconductors, an area where Europe has been strong, where it can become even stronger, stronger, and an area that can be a game changer for cybersecurity. So as you see, we're really working on it under the Security Union strategy to create all the instruments that will also strengthen the European capacity not just have uh, policies, not just uh, base ourselves on resilience, but also on the capacity to defend our systems. We also adopted a European cybersecurity strategy at the end of 2020. This was uh, basically renewing our vows uh, towards our commitment for uh, cybersecurity in Europe. And uh, to make that uh, more um, concrete, we adopted two proposals that are revising existing legislation in the European Union. 
addressing our critical infrastructures. The first was the revision of the so-called NIS directive. People in the know know what that means. It's the Network Information Systems Directive. It is uh, something that is rather recent in Europe, but we decided to strengthen it even more and to create a better harmonized system because we had a lot of disparities between member states, for instance, in the area of who is an, operation, an operator of essential services, as uh, they are called under the legislation, so a critical infrastructure, because in some member states they were recognized one way and in other member states in a different way, creating disparities in the internal market. So this is one uh, area that we fixed. The second was to strengthen the sanctions, to make them really severe, so that we create responsibility and that we create prevention, of course. And the third was to deal with the scope and extend the scope of the directive to those areas that matter the most. Because we had covered the traditional infrastructures like transport, banking, healthcare, etc., but and en energy, of course, uh, digital service providers. But it was time to look at also the at the manufacturing uh, industry, uh, food uh, that is essential for societies, the pharmaceutical and medical devices industry, but also going beyond that, uh, covering through the scope public administration, because now public administration is responsible for more and more vital systems, and their security also for data, since we're talking about data security, is fundamental. So we cannot, as states and as regulators, demand from operators to keep very high standards of cybersecurity and not do the same for our own systems. Take as an example the COVID pass that is now basically running our lives. Right? It's running our professional lives, our personal lives. This is managed by government systems. So if they do not maintain high levels of cybersecurity, data breaches can be severe because there you're talking about very personal data, sensitive data that costs a lot, that uh, can lead to loss of trust whenever there are breaches, and that can, of course, uh, compromise the whole system we are trying to create. So the NIS is doing a lot more than what people think. It is going exactly where the heart of the problems on security are. And to match the NIS, we have proposed an equal level of protection at the physical side. So this is the um, uh, directive on uh, critical uh, resilience uh, systems, uh, which ensures that where you have critical information systems, you also have high levels of security at the physical level. For instance, if you're going to protect uh, nuclear systems in nuclear plants, you need to also make sure that their outside security is covered. Otherwise, anyone can come in and, and go for a breach. So you have to match the ambition, and this is why we created a package of critical infrastructure measures, as we call it, rather than simply uh, focusing only on cybersecurity. You need to maintain cybersecurity high standards also by protecting where it is housed. So this is uh, the principle. Then another very important development in Europe was this recommendation that is now being discussed by many member states, and you're aware of it in Luxembourg, the Joint Cyber Unit. Again, there, what we were missing in Europe after we built legislation, after we built system of understanding, of knowledge, of collaboration uh, through the European agency, now the competence network, and I will come to that, we need something to counteract in case of attacks. As we know, we are uh, facing in Europe a major uh, skills uh, shortage in the area of cybersecurity. We'll never have alone, be that at member states or at EU level, sufficient experts to deal with the big cyber attacks, with big cyber incidents. So it was important to pool resources, create a European force, and we did that through a recommendation to allow member states to lead this initiative and to come forward, hopefully, by a timeline we have given of a deadline of June 2023, the creation of this joint cyber unit, which will be a defense mechanism for big cyber attacks. And of course, uh, we are not going to just preach at the level of the European institutions. We're going to practice what we preach. So by the end of the year, we're coming forward with a regulation to protect our own institutions and all the agencies. You know that one of the recent uh, cyber attacks around COVID was against the European Medicines Agency agencies when um, they were dealing with uh, the first uh, vaccine authorization. 
uh, and there was a, an important breach and many people were affected. And this showed the need to also uh, correct, uh, take corrective measures vis-a-vis -vis the protection of systems of European bodies. So we're coming forward with a proposal, a new regulation that will reflect what we've done uh, for uh, critical infrastructures in the NIS for the European institutions. And that covers the uh, European Commission, the Parliament, the Council, but also, as I mentioned, European agencies. And then, of course, more cooperation to advance cybersecurity. I mentioned already the Cybersecurity Competence Center. This is something we discussed a lot in Luxembourg when we were preparing the proposal, because you believe a lot in this network uh, system, which is, it is extremely interesting because you're a small country, so you're even more able to do it than others more easily. And I think you have uh, greatly achieved it. We have great examples in Luxembourg, in the Netherlands, and now the French are building something similar. Uh, we saw it in Lille last week. So this is now a reality. The Cybersecurity Competence Center and Network have been agreed uh, at the legislative level. And this is, uh, the seat has been decided, so the agency is being uh, built. And of course, we have the agreement on the budget of the European Union, so the programs are now start to be discussed. And we will see investments in cybersecurity through Horizon Europe, the Digital Europe program, but also the recovery and resilience facility. This is also very interesting because we have even more funds than we thought at the beginning of the mandate due to the recovery facility that was created following the pandemic. So cybersecurity will also gain from that. So money-wise, the Cybersecurity Competence Center will help a lot because it will pull resources on the recipient side and the advisor side where to spend it, but it will also make sure we avoid duplication and more importantly, we make programs that target sectors where we can deliver something, that we do not just do research that stays on the shelf and is never used or comes to the market. Now, uh, how have we delivered on this security union strategy, especially in the area of cybersecurity? I mentioned already some of the initiatives we've taken, and you can see here an overview. Uh, I wanted to mention also, other than the joint, secu security, um, joint cybersecurity unit, the uh, importance of certification. Certification is something that is now in place. We already have um, started the processes in Europe for a number of certifications for cybersecurity IT products and services. This is something that can place Europe at the forefront of safe and secure products. And this is something on, um, on which we intend to intensify the work together, of course, with the European Cybersecurity Agency and uh, uh, the uh, member states and stakeholders for uh, that work on that. Last but not least, uh, a very important area, which I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, is the area of skills. None of this, everything we promise to do or we're asking the market to do or the regulators to do, the governments to do, will be possible without the right uh, skills and the right workforce. And there we suffer in Europe as much as the rest of the world. So in our updated uh, skills agenda adopted also last year, we have made uh, we have created incentives for companies to come together and offer uh, opportunities for talents to be created. We already have the first seeds in that area. And we also hope that with the cybersecurity center, the network, we will be able to accumulate more, but also develop programs. And ISA has already created a, a program with advice for Europe, but we create also be able, we, we hope through the center we will be able to create programs for sponsoring these ideas, not just giving the ideas, but also helping them materialize. This is fundamental, because we know that the, the amount of people we're missing in Europe is huge, and uh, this links a little bit to what you heard earlier about me being part of this Women for Cyber. We try to pull in women as well, because it's a sector that traditionally had the shortage of women, because we need as many people as possible. I hope I have given you an overview of where we are in Europe. Cybersecurity remains central, and I think after the announcements of our president today, will become even more substantive, because now we're going to the operational side of cybersecurity in Europe. We have so far worked a lot on creating the union, the preparedness, but now we mean really business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Despina, for these inspiring words. And also thank you for the teaser on the State of the Union of the <laughs> President. Um, and thank you also for the participation to this uh, event today. Uh, now we are, we are welcoming Alexander Hanf, 
uh, co-founder and CEO of Think Privacy, he has a uniquely diverse background in computer science, psychology, sociology, and law, and has worked in tech for over 20 years. His presentation is entitled, A Message from the Future. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me here today. It's a great pleasure. It's my first trip since February last year, which is uh, strange when you normally travel 150 plus days per year speaking at places like this. Um, today, you're going to hear a lot of speeches about uh, the how and the what with regards to cybersecurity, the things that you need to do, the technologies that you can use to do them. You'll hear about ISMS systems, you'll hear about the role of the CISO, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to start by doing something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the why and why we do this stuff. And often we forget that there's actually a, a very valid reason and a human reason as to why we have technology and why we want to keep data safe and secure. So I'm a privacy guy. Um, I started my career in technology way back in the late 80s, um, writing video games in machine code um, and working for the British government in uh, systems testing for the welfare system there. Uh, and stayed in technology for a long time. But my background was very different to most people. So I grew up in a very poor family in a very violent home. Um, and my escape from that violence was technology. So back in the, the early 80s, you would find me in the local supermarket where they were selling the newest PCs, the Amstrad CPC 464 and the, the Commodore VIC-20 and, and all these machines from, from my glorious childhood. And I'd be the kid that was sat there at these demo computers with the magazines typing out the code from, the, I don't know if anybody remembers, you used to get code in the back of magazines, pages and pages and pages, and you type this code out. And this is how we all learn how to program back in the early days. Um, it wasn't like today where you have all these libraries and everything which can do it all for you and you just plug things in. We had to do things from scratch. Um, and that was my escape. So that is where I would be all the time. When I wasn't in school, I would be at the computers. I couldn't afford a computer because I was in a very poor family. Um, but that was my escape. That was my introduction to, to technology. And then my best friend went to university. I couldn't afford to go to university, so I just followed him, stayed in his student house, borrowed his lab card, went to his lectures, because back then we didn't have digital registrations. Nobody knew who was going to the lectures. You could just turn up, okay? So you could get a degree without actually doing a degree, which is fantastic. Um, I, I remember sitting his exam one day because he'd had too much to drink the night before, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't even registered as a student. So, you know, these were glorious times and a long way from where we are now, where everything is monitored through biometrics and, and everything else. Um, but it really was an empowering and enlightening thing for me. Technology was a beautiful thing. It made the world a much smaller place. It created what we now call the global village um, and empowered me to learn and to communicate and to see things I never would have seen uh, if, I'd managed, if I hadn't managed to find technology at the stage that I did. Eventually, I did manage to go to university and I studied psychology and computer science as a double major. Um, and the reason for that was because I was very interested in the impact of technology on people and how people interacted with technology. Um, and then I went to work in industry. So I worked for about 15 years in industry, uh, oil industry and various other government roles, et cetera, et cetera, um, deploying technologies, working and testing on new technologies, uh, and really getting a, a fine overview, and then teaching at, at a university. Um, and then it became apparent to me that technology was changing. This thing that I loved, this thing that I spent every waking hour breathing, it was coming out of my pores. I have a really bad sleep disorder as well, so I've been awake longer than most people twice my age, uh, which has given me a huge capacity for absorbing knowledge and accessing technology um, as a way to, to distract me from this. Uh, so this is what I did, and I, I spent days, literally without sleep, rummaging through FTP archives, uh, messing around on Gopher and Archie and all these old technologies that nobody remembers anymore before Google and Yahoo came along. Uh, and and it, came to me, it came to mind that technology was changing, that the internet, um, as I first knew it, back before the web browser was invented, um, where it was a place of knowledge, a place of, of power and accumulation, was becoming a place of commoditization and manipulation. And that concerned me deeply as a geek because my life revolves around technology. So I went back to university and I studied the impact of technology on society as a sociologist and started to focus on things like surveillance, on manipulation, um, 
and really looking at how technology had changed and, and whether or not my worries and concerns are true. And it turned out they were, um, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody in this room. Uh, and then in 2008, just as I was about to finish my second degree, where I was writing my dissertation on the impact of a Microsoft-centric academic system, where we teach people to use Microsoft products instead of teaching people how to use technology, um, I then became heavily involved in an ad tech uh, issue in the UK. There was a company in the UK called Form. They were developing a new ad tech um, system which used deep packet inspection, uh, embedded in the network of ISPs to build behavioral profiles of everybody who was visiting the web through those ISPs and then selling those profiles for vast amounts of money. At the time, 2008, beginning of February, they were a billion dollar company. They're now bankrupt, so I'm the first privacy advocate ever to bankrupt a billion dollar company, which is kind of wonderful. Um, but you know, it, I changed my dissertation at that point to look at a legal analysis of what they were doing. It seemed to me that this couldn't be legal in Europe a place of democracy, a place of freedom, a place of fundamental rights. So I went down the rabbit hole and I've been down there ever since, um, which is, again, probably not surprising to most people in this room. And one thing became very clear. We, we kind of lost our way. If we go back to the, the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, where everything was about democratization, was about the sharing of knowledge, we've really started to commoditize and manipulate. And you know, as I said, my concerns were realized uh, during my studies as I was looking at things like the Patriot Act and, and various other schemes which had occurred around the world uh, in relation to um, surveillance and privacy. And then obviously the ad tech campaign uh, in the UK, which became one of the biggest campaigns that the European Commission had ever seen, led to the changes to the e-privacy directive requiring all these cookie banners. Yes, you can thank me for that. Please don't throw fruit. Um, and then obviously the development of GDPR, and then I worked with the European Parliament on the upcoming e-privacy regulation as well. So the last 15 years really, my life has been absorbed by European policy and law um, in developing a new future in the way that we manage data. And I work with companies as a consultant, advising them on privacy by design, um, security by design, data protection by design, identity, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, you're going to hear a whole bunch about the methodologies and the technologies which are available uh, throughout the rest of this day. But we still lose that human-centric approach. We still don't seem to remember why we do all this. And I had a light bulb moment in 2015. I'd been lobbying in Brussels as the only registered privacy lobbyist, which, believe me, in an environment of 30,000 industry lobbyists is not a comfortable place to be. Uh, <laughs> so the only registered privacy lobbyist in Brussels, and I was really struggling to, to, to make MEPs understand the reality of the issues that we were facing. Because, you know, lobbyists, uh, we're a lonely breed when it comes to civil society. There are many, many industry lobbyists out there get paid huge amounts of money. We're all self-funded, mostly. Um, so, you know, you have politicians who are hearing thousands of voices on the benefits of technology, on the benefits of these new digital market economies um, that we're hearing about all of the time. You know, how, much, how many jobs this is going to create, how much money this is going to push into the economy. We won't talk about taxes because that's a very controversial issue. Um, but they only hear the, you know, this very tiny voice about fundamental rights and privacy from civil society and lobbyists like myself. And there's a massive imbalance. And when you're talking about the economy, particularly coming out of the back of recession, which we were at the, at the time where GDPR was really coming into effect, um, it's very difficult to persuade politicians just how important uh, it is to, to respect and maintain these fundamental rights. Because you know, everybody likes to think that the economy is going to be strong, people can have jobs, they can buy houses, send their kids to school, etc., etc. And I can understand and respect that. But when I first came across a, a company which you've probably all heard of now called Cambridge Analytica, it really gave me a, a strong opportunity to grab the attention of politicians. And I hosted two events at the European Parliament in 2015, 2016, before Cambridge Analytica became a big press story. Uh, and for the first time ever, I saw the lights turn on in politicians' heads. When I explained to them that you know, this, these types of technology, this isn't tinfoil hat stuff anymore. We're not just talking about the inconvenience of spam emails or SMS messages which annoy us at 5 o'clock in the morning. We're talking about their jobs. 
We're talking about a technology which has been weaponized to the point where we're using psychographic profiling to manipulate democracy, to lead people to vote for things that they wouldn't rationally do. Because psychographic profiling isn't about rationality, it's about emotion. It's the opposite of rationality. And it's used to manipulate. And it was invented, actually, way back in the early, 19, uh, early 1900s um, by a psychologist, I'm ashamed to say, uh, who was looking at ways to improve marketing. So it's really born out of marketing that's now been weaponized. And I was at a conference in Brussels in 2019. It was the uh, International um, Data Protection Commissioners Conference. And um, Tim Cook was giving the keynote. And he explained very clearly that technologies uh, which we use every single day have been weaponized. Our personal data has been weaponized against us. And privacy has become something which is critical to society. So, you know, I finally had an opportunity to, to get the attention of politicians and really make them understand these issues. And, it, you know, after looking into this as a, as a social scientist and considering what the potential consequences were, we're so often focused on the present or the, the recent past. You know, so we're, we're, our, our minds, our email inboxes are flooded with news about data breaches and ransomware and all of these other things which we have to focus on every single day in a defensive manner to try and protect the information that we have or to try and mitigate the damage as a result of the breaches that, that have occurred. And we rarely think about the prospects of the future. And as people who work in cybersecurity and people who work in, in privacy and data in general, it's really important that we understand the impact that technology will have on the future, that the, the impact that data ethics will have on the future, not just on our future, but future generations, our children, our grandchildren. And as somebody who studied psychology, one of the things which is very clear to me is what we call normalization, where we start to use technology over and over again to the extent where, even if it's invasive, it becomes normalized. It becomes the sort of thing that people don't think about anymore. And this is you know, never more true than it is today. I remember back in about eight, 10 years ago, uh, in the UK, there was a big controversy about having biometric fingerprints in primary schools, these scanners, for children to be able to access the library or to be able to get their school lunch. So they'd have to provide their biometric fingerprint. And this, at the time, was a really worrying thing because it normalized this behavior of surveillance, these technologies, which are really quite uh, intrusive, and if they fall into the wrong hands, can have quite significant consequences. And just like the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where we saw Facebook provided access to data in a way which wasn't appropriate, and then that data being amassed on scale and used to profile and manipulate individuals, we see the same thing happening over and over again. And we really need to consider what that means. And often, you know, I, I work in privacy, so I'm often the guy in the room who everybody hates, right? Because I'm putting up obstacles and roadblocks and, and telling you what you can't do. And as a computer scientist, I can see the conflict there because I understand as a computer scientist the desire to collect data and do what we can and see what wonderful things we can, we can create from that data. So there's this kind of conflict in, uh, between my privacy work and my work as a geek, um, which is always going to be there. But at the same time, we need to understand that if we're moving into an algorithmic world where everything we do is manipulated, where all the choices we make are not actually choices, but they're the result of psychographic profiling or similar technologies, where we're being, having our emotions manipulated to take uh, irrational decisions, to build irrational opinions, et cetera, et cetera. And whether that be on terrorism, whether that be on immigration, whether that be on anything else, if it isn't rational, then it doesn't belong in our world, right? Because we then, if we start acting on emotions, we're not going to find satisfactory results. But what does that also mean for autonomy? As a data ethicist, I often talk about what autonomy means in a world of algorithms. If we don't have choices, if we're being manipulated into every decision we make, and believe me, this is increasingly the case, then autonomy goes. We no longer have free choice. The thing which makes us the innovative, forward-moving uh, species that we are vanishes. So often I hear that you know, uh, privacy is, is a hurdle. It's a, it's a, it creates a, a problem for the use and the development of inno and innovative and emerging technologies. And I say to those people, say, well, no, it isn't. I say, because without privacy, we lose innovation. Because if we don't have privacy, 
then we don't have autonomy. If we don't have autonomy, we don't have self-determination. If we don't have self-determination, we don't have freedom of thought. If we don't have freedom of thought, then we don't think outside the box. If we don't think outside the box, we don't innovate. We become static. We become stagnant. So our very future, the future of innovation, the future of technology, is absolutely dependent on our ability to be individuals, to have free choice, to find solutions to the problems that we face, instead of being pushed into every decision we make by an algorithm. So when we think about that for future generations, and as a, as a father, you know, this is something which concerns me deeply, is I want the children of the future to have the same opportunities that I had. I came from a really dark background and I elevated myself as a result of, of technology. Technology was really my savior, one could say. And I want other children in the future who have similar dark backgrounds or even who have you know, wonderful family lives to have the same opportunities to be able to look at technology as something which empowers them, something which makes the world a much smaller place, something which allows people to communicate, which transcends borders and race and prejudice. The things that we all aspire to in the 80s and the 90s when the internet was first being developed. It was a joyous time, it really was. Anybody in the room who was in technology at that time will recall just how wonderful it was. And if we lose that, and if we lose that for future generations, then that's a real tragedy. It's something that we should really be ashamed of if we allow that to happen. So don't think about privacy, don't think about cybersecurity as something which is a hurdle. Think about it as something which is a safeguard, something which guarantees an equitable future, something which guarantees the ability to share knowledge, to nurture in the imagination, to create innovative products and services moving into the future, to democratize the world in ways which we've never seen. So we don't have to have another Arab Spring. So we don't have to have to worry about hospitals being hit by ransomware and people dying. So we don't have to worry about uh, COVID and other pandemics because we have the technology there to be able to track and manage these diseases. Technology is a wonderful thing. It can be used for great good. If we think about the Zika virus going back several years now and the technologies which were used to track the Zika virus and stop it effectively in its tracks in a very short time period. But then we also think about Edward Snowden and his revelations around how governments are using technology to manipulate people, to track their behavior, to look at their social graphs, um, to put them on lists, to restrict their freedoms, to, to restrict their rights. This is something in Europe which we take very seriously. We, we consider fundamental rights and freedoms to be integral to our demo democratic society. That's why we have the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's why I'm so excited to be in a hotel literally behind the European Court of Justice because as an institution, it's done more for our rights uh, within the European Union than anything else we could have imagined. So we should be proud of this. We should embrace this. We should look at these protections and safeguards not only as what they are, but as our responsibility, our obligation to ensure that future generations have the same opportunities that we had. And if we can do that, then we can start to deal with the issues that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. But if we keep looking at security and privacy as a hurdle, as something which is getting in your way, then we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. We really are, and I can't stress that enough. So the message from the future, and my slide isn't up, but I had a, a slide. Do you, yeah, you can't read it there. But I was, I was on uh, a popular social media site the other day, and I saw a meme which said, if they haven't come back from the future to stop us, how bad can it be? And it got me thinking about Terminator, and actually, more aptly, the, the announcement of Matrix 4 coming out, which I have to say I'm incredibly excited about. Um, if no one's traveled back in time to stop us, how bad can it be? Uh, we, we have to consider that you know, just just because we're doing things that we don't understand the potential consequences of our and how far reaching those consequences may be, we have to try and understand what the impact might be on future generations. So my message from the future is we have to really focus on maintaining the fundamental rights, maintaining data ethics and integrity in our day-to-day -day activities around technology and the data that we're using. If we have any data scientists in the room, um, then your job is not an easy one. I understand that. Um, but you must take into consideration what the consequences of your work might be and how that data and how that technology can be used in ways which you may not have designed or intended it to be used for. 
And more importantly for organizations, we're moving into an age where ethics has become integral as a business priority. If you look at Gartner's reports, which they publish every year, data ethics is in the top 10 now, I think, for the last two or three years. Privacy has been in the top 10 for a couple of years now as well. Um, but it's not just about market share anymore. It's not just about customers. It's not just about reputation from a, a retail or a, or a commercial perspective. It's also about the ability to acquire talent. I'm really pleased to see the younger generations moving to the workplace, focusing on working for ethical companies. This has become a priority with, the, with the, the youth of today, making sure that the companies that they're going to dedicate their lives to and give so much of their time to are operating in ethical ways. And it fills me with inspiration when I see demonstrations over things like Dragonfly at Google or facial recognition technology at Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And we should really be inspired by and push these younger generations to maintain this and keep us on our toes and make sure that we fulfill our promise to future generations that we'll remain safe, that we'll remain democratic, and that we'll give them the same opportunities which were afforded to us so many years ago. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. So thank you very much, Mr. Han, for this insightful presentation and for choosing European Security Forum to be back since uh, February 2020. Um, now we are going to move into a roundtable to discuss why cybersecurity is everyone's business in an organization. It's going to be moderated by André Meyer, Security Practice Lead Luxembourg Accenture, who has a hands-on technical background, a strong strategic mindset, and a proven track record in leading complex IT transformations. And he is joined by Barbara Daroca, Head of Corporate Services ING Luxembourg, Nicolo Poli, CEO HSBC Luxembourg, Nazir Subairi, CEO Loft, Deborah Plein, Coordination Be Secure, Ministère de l'Education Nationale de, de l'Enfance et de la Jeunesse, and André Adelsbach, Vice President, Group Information and Cybersecurity at SES. Dear speakers, the stage is all yours. So my name is Andre Meyer. I'm the uh, lead of security for the Accenture Luxembourg practice. And well, as we were already announced, um, my colleagues uh, lead us in their own rights for their unique points of views and vantage points in different companies and different, also I would say, industries. So cybersecurity, it, it addresses all of us, like everyone in the room, everyone outside. Um, and it touches us in very different ways, and everyone has different responsibilities on how we cover those. So I would like to open the old discussion that we have with how in your each respective roles do you feel impacted by cybersecurity? Um, how about we start with Andre then? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, obviously, as I'm um, yeah, really into cybersecurity, that's really the, the core of my, my role, so <laughs> no surprise that this uh, affects me. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, w when you are responsible for, for cybersecurity in a, in a corporate environment, you quickly realize that, um, yeah, you cannot do this on your own. So this goes far beyond the, um, um, yeah, the, the core security function like security management, uh, security governance, um, security engineering or operations. So you really need to interact and um, create um, strong um, ties throughout the organization, for example, with legal, um, uh, internal audit, internal communications, human capital. So this is really a team effort in a, in a lar larger organization. So, and that's why I think this, this round table is really a great opportunity to emphasize this. Sorry for that, my apologies, everyone survived, no one got hurt. <laughs> Sorry, they want to run. 
Uh, okay, so uh, yes, um, I'm Deborah from Be Secure. I'm working for the National Youth Service who coordinates the initiative Be Secure. Uh, we also are in a European network um, called Safer Internet Centers in SAFE. So we deal a lot with cybersecurity awareness raising and I would like to add maybe also cyber, uh, cyber safety awareness raising because it's about um, let's say, um, empowering and making the, the children and young people more resilient with the current technology, but also telling them to raise questions about how it, how it will be in the future, how to deal with the now and how to deal maybe in the future and to shape technology in that way. But our role as B-Secure is really to go out to the schools, for example, we do cyber safety trainings in, in every seventh grade in Luxembourg. It's a mandatory thing for 10 years, which I find very important. And we see um, it's a very good thing uh, to go to children, youngsters, to tell them to uh, think critical and to look after themselves and in other, uh, for others and use um, technology in a responsible way. I could talk a lot and I was really inspired by your talk. So um, I'm currently thinking also about issues like privacy, all the questions related to that, those are the topics that we raise awareness about, especially in young people here in Luxembourg. Yes. Um, yeah, well, my case a bit like uh, Andrea said before me, I work in a large organization, so cybersecurity is uh, uh, key for us, for our staff first, uh, uh, or and, not first or second, but and for our clients, obviously, I work for a bank, so uh, banks are very often targeted and their clients too, um, so it's definitely something we talk a lot about. It's a team effort, indeed, everybody needs to be involved. The people themselves, because the human factor, as we will talk later, I think it's uh, very important and difficult to manage, um, but also in terms of uh, policies and, and awareness and, and internal communication, it's, uh, it's key, it's day-to-day, uh, -day. and as a mom, as you both said, indeed, the young kids, uh, last year we were in homeschooling and suddenly even four or five year olds were on teams. Um, and it starts to normalize being on teams and being, seeing my friends uh, through a camera and it's uh, great, nice, and also a bit scary at sometimes. So definitely a da daily thing. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I think from our side, there's um, sort of three broad areas around cybersecurity where our involvement lies. One is um, supporting firms, uh, providing cybersecurity solutions to the financial services industry, which um, I think is great, gaining greater and greater prominence uh, given the focus on that area. Uh, two is looking at trends and the future of cybersecurity, working with, say, the research institutes in Luxembourg and other bodies on an international level. Um, I think a lot of focus there in particular is around uh, the, the, the arms race that is generally occurring and uh, the rise in computing power. I had a very interesting conversation last week with the ex-CEO Bell Labs around quantum computing and its potential impact on uh, cybersecurity and what institutions will have to do in terms of their competence uh, once that kind of technology is available. And I guess third is from our own businesses perspective, um, dealing and managing cybersecurity within the organization um, I think therein, we're obviously, we're not a financial institution. I don't think we've been targeted for hacking. Um, we all run Apple Max, which maybe lulls us into a sense of security, um, because they seem to be less targeted. Um, I think it's more about the, 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 what we look to deal with is more about the balance between um, usability and security. I mean, as, as you said, we were all on various digital formats last year and dealing with different organizations' requirements and what platforms they could access. Some could do Zoom, some couldn't do Zoom, some could do Teams. It, I mean, it was a bit slightly problematic, you know. It's uh, not particularly convenient. Um, and I'm surprised nobody came out with a solution like one size fits all and could bypass everyone. But uh, you know, there are these tussles between usability and security as well. So um, those are sort of three areas where we look at it. But you mentioned the, the, the big topic here being usability, right? I mean, the, the more we increase security, usually the more it impacts our usability, our comfort levels. Um, I'm not sure. Do, do we have Nicolo on the line? I'm not sure. Nicolo, you would hear us? Ah, there we can see you. Yep. Perfect. Great. So, what's your, your how, how do you feel as the CEO of the of, of HSBC? How do you feel impacted by this? How do you see cybersecurity being part of your daily life? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and apologies for everyone in the room for having such a big picture of my face. Um, that can't be very pleasant, but uh, <clears throat> I just try to ignore it. So look, I think our role as a bank is to keep customers' money safe. That's primarily it. And the cybercrime is about trying to access those funds and, and take them. And the form in which they do that is always the, the weakest link. It's the easiest way in. And that used to be hacking, right? Going into the systems, the servers behind the firewalls. For the last decade, it's actually been more about social engineering, getting access to our staff and getting their passwords and being able to access our systems that way. And ever since COVID and sort of mass digitalization and the virtual, everything going slightly virtual, the easiest way in to customers' money is often through them themselves, uh, especially for vulnerable customers. So, you know, my role as a, as a bank is to try and keep customers' money safe at all times. And the way we do that for cybercrime has changed and evolved over time. And we just need to stay on top of that. All right, thank you. Um, so how about we, we take a, a real world example? Like how, how has it been an impact? Um, well, you, you just told us actually on, on what your responsibility as a bank is and how social engineering becomes a problem um, despite the technical measures we put in place. How, do you have a recent example or, or something that, that comes across your mind from, from something like that happened? Yeah, Andre, let me share something that happened earlier this year. Um, and it's a real example and, uh, and still under investigation. But um, we were contacted, HSBC Private Bank in Luxembourg was contacted uh, by some lawyers of a, a French lady who would uh, uh, classify as vulnerable, uh, demanding that we return the money that she invested, you know, into, uh, through us into various schemes. We looked on our systems here locally, we couldn't find her. We looked in France, we couldn't find her. We looked in the UK, ever. we couldn't find her anywhere. She was not a client of the bank. And so we reverted to the lawyers and said, can you provide us a little bit more information as to you know, what, what you're looking for? And they provided us with the investment pitch that um, this individual subscribed to. And we're not talking small money, it was 320,000 euros, uh, fundamentally life savings. And when we looked at that, there were numerous what we'd call red flags, right? And we're, we're trained to look at this, our staff is, is well trained, 99.9% .9 would have never invested in this. There were things like, you know, multiple SPVs, offshore tax havens like the Caymans, use of cryptos. The people that were purporting to do this had Gmail addresses. Um, so our brand logo was old. The, the CFO, the group CFO that signed it had left five years ago. There were lots of red flags. Nonetheless, this individual has lost, you know, over 300,000 euros. Um, and so I think the question is, so we contacted our lawyers as well and said, you know, what, what is our role in this? She's not even a, a customer of the bank, but clearly we were used to defraud her of her funds. And uh, their answer to us was, well, look, you didn't make it easy for her to verify the information. If I go on your website, there's no way to contact you if I've got questions around investments that are purported to be from you. Uh, so, you know, what their main complaint of ours was to say, you've got to make it easy for people to check that things are legitimate or not. Um, and so we did do that immediately. We updated our website so that you could contact us and have a conversation with the person to see if you know, we were really behind that investment. We also alerted the CSSF who put a warning on their website saying, be careful about um, who's using HSBC a private banking a brand in Lux. And I think more generically though, this leads us onto the question, which is, you know, we do a lot of training for our staff to identify this stuff. What, what training should we be doing to our customers? Right, and where does our role begin and where does it end in this? Where is our responsibility? And I don't think it's for everybody, but it is for vulnerable customers. You know, when whatever bank did release these hundreds of thousands of euros of funds, what checks did they do on where it was going? Um, you know, was it just a drop down saying, I'm sending it to the Caymans for investment purposes? Should we be doing a little bit more due diligence? And I think it's a, it's a tricky question. And there's a lot of debate now in terms of um, what should our role be in, in preventing this? And again, we don't want to be too intrusive, but at the same time, we recognize that uh, some people are out there are vulnerable and um, you know, we should be ensuring the safety of their funds. And I think that that's the big point here, right? So you, you mentioned that you do trainings on your side and it, it's, an, it's an ongoing threat, it's an evolving threat, uh, it takes time. And I think Barbara, you also, sorry. I was just going to say that uh, the social engineering, the fraud aspect is, is very becoming increasingly prevalent, as Nicola said. Um, one quick example that was right next door to mine and Nicola's building, because we are next door to each other, next to Acceler, Metal was, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, somebody erected a fake 
a mobile phone tower and was sucking in people's data. Um, so anyone typing anything onto their phone, they were connecting, their network was connecting to this fake tower and they were able to extract. So if you were accessing your bank details on this, they were getting it, right? And apparently it was there for about a day and a half before anyone realized it. So anyone walking around that area on their mobile, data's gone. So if, if we take the, the common denominator here, it's us humans, right? So it, it's in, in, the, in the end, there, there are solutions on many different layers. So we are the first line of defense that we should notice abnormal things. We should be aware of red flags and so on. So how, how I mean, Barbara, I think you mentioned this. How do we tackle this in, in a corporate way? How do you, on, on your side, try to keep your employees up to speed on this? Um, yeah, training is key, uh, as uh, Nicola pointed out. I think it's very important to uh, try to find a middle ground between uh, easy prey or vulnerable uh, uh, people in general to uh, extreme paranoia because uh, we do a lot of training and especially a lot of awareness. And then I send out a survey to my staff and I get very slow, small response rate because people are afraid there was a link in the email and I didn't know where it was coming from. And I'm like, yes, okay, but let's, like uh, Nicolo said, let's learn the red flags, let's learn how to act and let's be patient because sometimes we live in this world of uh, now here, click, 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 click. <laughs> let's maybe think about it, run the mouse over it, see what happens and not giving any tips. I am not the geek, I am a communications person. Um, we do do a lot of training. We don't expect everybody to be a cybersecurity expert in the bank. Uh, it's a large bank and we have everything from uh, lawyers to salespeople to, of course, yes, cybersecurity experts. They should be experts. Um, but everybody would benefit from basic training and basic knowledge. Um, we do this through training. I think something that works really well is uh, we have e-learning modules where you can go through actual cases and see what your response would have been, but in a safe uh, space. Even better is uh, unannounced live tests, when you actually send out a probe and see who clicks, <laughs> the one that you shouldn't have clicked on. <laughs> and then really, you know, with obviously everything is fake, but you with a message of, you know, you cannot access your files, and then you're in the office and you're starting to sweat, like, oh, whoa, 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 what did I do? Um, that really opens people's eyes, because again, you get masses of emails every day, and if it's well done, well masked, um, you might, in the rush of the day, click on it. Um, it is important for us, uh, well, Nicole already talked about the, about the clients, but even our own staff, um, that they are aware of uh, threats to the bank, not necessarily in their, in their inbox and through the phone with the CEO scam and things like this, but when they are on social media, for example, and they see fishy things. And uh, just earlier this year, it was our own staff that flagged two fake Facebook pages perpetrating to be ING Luxembourg. And they were extremely well done. We were really, really surprised. And luckily, we were only live for a few hours and nothing happened. No funds were lost. Nobody was uh, frauded or hacked or anything. Um, but it is scary because it goes really, really very fast. Coming up in October, we have a series of uh, talks, for example. Uh, this is done at a worldwide level at ING, so anybody can log in through uh, Teams and Zoom. Um, and it goes from really expert things from endpoint security and access management and so on to more light, I'm going to say, cybersecurity topics like the human factor. What are you supposed to do? And if you're in a client-facing position or even if you aren't, what uh, are things to, to be aware of? Here locally in Luxembourg, and I'm going to finish my answer here, um, we are a member of the ABBL, the Banking Association, and there is a, a working group cybersecurity there, and uh, one of our cybersecurity experts uh, participates there also. And I think that's really good because it helps us to share best practices, to discuss threats and risks, to uh, share also lessons learned, uh, maybe more on an expert level, but it's, uh, I think it's key and it's important we are a relatively small community, which has it, uh, its advantages. You can know the other guy on the other side and uh, talk about it. So all these things, again, a mix of training and, and awareness, mostly for me, awareness. People should be aware. I, I absolutely agree. So, but as we, as we know, or as we've heard before, um, sometimes people are in a rush, mistakes happen, and you click on the link. Or someone installs a fake antenna somewhere. So how do we protect once we have breached the human? Right? How do we protect ourselves? Like technically, I think Andre, you're perfectly suited for that question. What do you think? How do you, how can we do this? Um, yeah. So actually, you need to to have a, a layered set of defenses, and and the human factor uh, awareness is definitely an important one. Um, but it is a, a, a yeah a matter of fact that uh, that um, attacks go through right. Um, 
if you look at it, even if you're running, a, let's say, a successful or a very successful awareness campaign and you look at uh, simulated uh, phishing emails and the click rates, you will be probably still around 5%, depending on, on how, how well uh, the, the thing is, is done. Um, so meaning uh, a determined attacker just has to send uh, an average of 20, uh, 20 of these emails um, yeah, to be successful and to, to have somebody uh, click, click the link or, or the, uh, the uh, malicious attachment. So it's going to happen and in these cases, uh, yeah, you definitely want to make sure you, you offer your users um, a safety net. Um, for example, uh, thinking about um, uh, secure web gateways um, where you, let's say, even if a user clicked on the link, you have uh, have a, a relatively good uh, likelihood of of still blocking access to to that malicious website, or if if uh, that website is not blocked and it serves malware, that uh, the antivirus will be kicking in and and block uh, block the the malware and protect the user. Um, so technology is an is an important um, let's say supplement to uh, to your human firewall. Um, then lo looking more at, uh, at the end endpoint security, um, th that's another important aspect. So if, if also your web gateways um, failed and, and the, the malware gets on the system, you want to have a, a, good, a good endpoint security um, solution that, uh, that detects uh, based on behavior analysis um, that something is, is malicious and, and blocks um, that, that uh, unknown malware uh, during execution. Um, but you also need to have a solid um, detection capabilities um, because if an attacker managed to get uh, initial access to, to, your, uh, to a corporate system, um, then that kind of detection for, for lateral movement activities or privilege escalation, um, that's important that, that you have um, the, the technical means to detect this, uh, raise alarms, and then obviously you need also a capable um, security operations team that... Uh, um, that can can look at these events and can can take the right uh, right uh, um, actions to to still block this this ongoing attack. Um, the team needs to be knowledgeable, um, well trained, uh, but also it needs to be empowered to to take uh, quick actions like blocking a user account, even if it means yeah we have to take a user offline for uh, for a certain amount of time, and he cannot do his work. But um, yeah, at this stage, it's <laughs> better safe than sorry because. Um, these modern and specifically ransomware actors, um, they, they act extremely fast and if you don't react fast, um, you risk of, of having a, a far bigger issue at the end of, of the day. Um, yeah, so de detection and response capabilities are a very important um, aspect of a yeah, more holistic uh, approach to cybersecurity as well. Uh, finally, Going back to, to security awareness, I, I think one important thing is also that um, a lot of users in the end, when they clicked on, on something malicious, they often still realize. So the, the, the initial click, it happened maybe when, when they were not completely focused and they were just checking emails at the end of the day and wanted to do this final, final piece of work and, and then things um, happen. And when they do realize it's important that they know how to report and also that there is a culture of, yeah, that, that they feel like, okay, I'm not going to be blamed if I, if I speak up and report that there was a mishap, but that you really, as part of the awareness program, um, educate users on how to report in, in the right manner and also encourage them to, yeah, to, to come forward with, uh, with these kind of mishaps. So that's the important thing. Thank you very much. Um, if, so if, if we think about, we said people need to be trained. You said um, we have technology safety nets in place, right? Everything has to be managed still by humans. So we come back to the point that even if we have technology in place and someone needs to maintain it. So looking at, at this again, um, personally, I, I'm looking for professionals for over a year and a half now, and I have a severe lack in, in candidates, right? There is a lack of talent. Um, so I assume that from, from a lot of point of view, you, you work with startups with new technology, new companies. How, how do you see that? Do you have a lot of people coming in? Do you, have, do you find people? Personally, I don't. So I, if you have tips for me, I'm, I'm taking them. No, I mean, this is, from our perspective, very, very worrying, right? It's not just about finding talent in Luxembourg. Uh, quite frankly, I think this is a huge issue um, and I think Nicola can comment on this as well, in banking and finance generally, right? I mean, if I take it at the macro level, graduates, even on, in any form, be it on the business side as well, are not attracted to work in banks anymore, right? 
Um, it's not like it was 20 years ago where banking was the job to go into. Now, most graduates want to go and work for Facebook or Amazon or someone, right? I mean, I talked to the careers um, team at my old university and they said, yeah, I mean, nobody wants to work in a bank anymore. And we used to be a feeder for the banks in London. Then you go on to the IT side, so let's take it down a step. I mean, the modern IT professional, the highly skilled ones, I mean, they're all going, the best ones, where do they go? They go to Google, Amazon, Facebook, the big techs, because firstly, as some, I remember about a year or two ago, um, somebody claimed, no, they don't, we can pay more at the banks, and I said, no, you don't, a senior developer at Amazon will get $300,000, I mean, you can't even compete with that, right? Plus, they offer a more engaging and entertaining environment, or they're perceived to offer that environment, whereas banking is boring. So you're not getting the, anywhere near the best IT talent in banking. And then cybersecurity, which is still quite a niche sub area in terms of university training and courses, growing, obviously, but still a niche area. I mean, where are those guys going, right? The last place they're going is into banking. So the, I, I'm really worried, because as Nicholas said, this is our money, right, and our assets. And yet, all the evidence shows the talent that's there protecting this is not particularly of high quality. No offense to anyone that works in bank IT, I'm sorry if you're offended. And you know, it's, it's a trend, right? And there is some talent there, but over the years, it's gonna, as the threat is increasing, the talent pool is declining. And that is really worrying. Um, you know, I was reading the latest um, draft circular on IT outsourcing uh, from the CSSF here. And what was interesting in there on the section on cybersecurity was, okay, you can outsource your cybersecurity, which I think increasingly banks will have to do to get the best quality, but then a bank will still have to perform a certain level of management and tests on this, and then, you know, penetration tests. And I said, well, the reason they're outsourcing it is because they don't actually know how to do this effectively in the first place. So a bank performing penetration tests is probably quite pointless because they don't really necessarily will, will not necessarily have that skill set. So we need to be able to create a framework where banks can access that quality of, 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 of uh, 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 cybersecurity prevention. Um, and that's probably going to be external. But then generally, we need to find a way to be able to attract that. And it's, money is one thing, but it's probably more so about culture and environment that the, the engineers are looking for these days. Right. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, yesterday, even I was talking to a, a couple of colleagues also in the industry, same thing. Everyone has open positions. No one finds anyone. Across Europe, even if you go wider, I mean, so if anyone is listening and you're trying, thinking about cross-skilling or jumping in, you have a couple of people recruiting here to send us our things. Um, if, if we look at it, though, as, as you mentioned, we can outsource this, right? And we can recruit, sure. But we will need local people on this as well. So look, coming then, I mean, Deborah, you, you are at the source here. You, you go to the, the younglings and inform them how to be secure and motivate them maybe to join a career in that. So what, how, how do you do this? How, how can you make it more attractive to people to stay here, to not leave the country for big tech somewhere in the States or somewhere else, but stay here and, and get active in the field? How can we do this? Okay, the younglings. I haven't heard that before, but uh, thank you. That's also very nice. So the younglings. Uh, children and youngsters, I, it might happen that, like we just heard in that story, there's um, a young child sitting at home, um, discovering, exploring with IT, using technology. Oh, I'm interested. Oh, I'm talented. But we cannot rely solely on this to happen. So we need spaces where children are encouraged and where they can explore that they are interested and that they have actually talent and try themselves out. So we have those types of um, spaces here in Luxembourg. For example, the maker spaces. Um, there's the uh, um, governmental initiative Be Creative, for example. Um, they provide and they um, push the makerspace movement here in Luxembourg. Um, makerspaces can be in schools and libraries, wherever, so um, where children can go to and they um, get in touch with others who are interested in technology and explore how to code, how to build robotics, or to discover all kinds of fields that are related to IT because it's not only coding. So this is that. Um, Speaking as Be Secure on raising awareness and being very active in the education sector, um, 
it's uh, very important for also for children as consumers or the younglings as consumers. They they uh, are when they go on the internet, they are in the world of platforms of commercial platforms. They are customers. So um, I think one thing is what we do is be secure to empower the children, young people um, to um, be aware of the risks and how to deal with them in a good way. Um, but I think being here. Um, also speaking to companies that maybe have children as customers, just a very nice number to know is one in three users of the internet is a child. At least that was a statistic a few years ago. Probably now with COVID and everything, it might be more. So just to have in mind when designing services, um, children might use them even if they are not <laughs> uh, the t primary target group, uh, group, but if they are a primary target group. Um, there are now some very nice recommendations from a European um, from a Eurocream network, uh, the Better Internet for Kids uh, strategy, they provide on their web page, for example, recommendations for companies how to create offers on the internet and services that are in mind with designing for children and youngsters who are there. So um, what we can do to have more creators in the future is really to encourage um, well, in a systematic way in schools. Um, in Luxembourg, for example, there's a new um, uh, subject in the seventh grade called digital sciences, which is now introduced this fall in, in the seventh grade in 18 schools that do a pilot phase with it. And for example, there it's a good example within education to have the uh, thematics of robotics, of encryption, of everything around digital sciences. So this is a really good start, I think, also to have it implemented in the curriculum besides the awareness training and also the non-formal education, which is so important because, as we heard from the story, um, interests and exchange on things like technologies have a a lot of in non-formal settings, so everybody as a private person can also contribute with all kinds of initiative and creativity to contribute. So I think I would stop because someone wants to say something. <laughs> yes. I was just going to add, I mean, I think a big one of the slight problems with cybersecurity particularly is that it's a hygiene factor, right? Um, you just expect it to be there, and it doesn't sound particularly ex exciting, you know, building security firewalls and etc. Um, if I may, I mean, you mentioned a few organizations, uh, Room 42 at Security Made in LU. Um, it's a practical experience. I would highly recommend anyone do it. It's fun, right? And you have some fun, take a team in there, and you really get to experience it, and I think will help raise awareness in most organizations. So a big shout out to them. Absolutely. I mean, we have, we have a couple of those. Um, then we have a couple of initiatives as well. So I think this is great. And I think also, looking at all of this, so we covered that employees need to be trained. We know that we have to give them a safety net because everyone slips up every now and then. We know that we have to train the children to be first more aware because we are learning as we are going. We can prepare them better for, for what we are prepared for right now. So we are catching up to this. Um, then we have customers, obviously, which are outside of the reach of most people. They're, maybe they are employees somewhere and get the training. They can find these red flags and be avoided to fall victim. But I think there's, there's work for everyone. And um, thanks, everyone, for sharing their, their unique point of view. I think they were great inputs. Uh, I think most of us will be around the rest of the conference. So if anyone has more questions, um, I'm sure we, you, can, you can find us somewhere, ask those. And thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you everyone for these great interventions. It was very interesting to see that also the financial uh, industry has the same issues as cybersecurity overall, finding human resources. Um, so the next presentation is offered in collaboration with the Luxembourg Trade and Investments Offices to connect with entrepreneurs worldwide. I am pleased to invite on stage Frederik Becker, project manager of the Luxembourg Ministry of Economy, uh, to present the session. Good uh, morning, everyone. So my name is Frederick Becker from the Ministry of, of Economy, and uh, I'm going to present you the session from the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Offices. So firstly, our Trade and Investment Offices are offices that are located all over the world, uh, being it in, in San Francisco, being it in, in, in Abu, Abu Dhabi, in, uh, in, in Taipei, or in, uh, or in Tel Aviv. Right? But the, the last two, we have companies uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that will present uh, today. So the aim of the trade offices is twofold, I would say. Huh? It's on the one hand, for you com Luxembourg-based companies, 
to, to reach out to them whenever you, you want to do business abroad, huh? especially in the cities where they are located or nearby. And on the other hand, of course, their role is to connect with local ecosystems uh, in, in, in the cities they, they add and to, uh, to bring those companies in connection with, with the Luxembourg uh, ecosystem, which is actually the aim of the, of the session of today, where we will present to you three companies, so two from Taipei, one from, uh, from Tel Aviv, that will, uh, that, that, that will give you an overview uh, of their solutions. And here it's startups, so they will pitch their solution and, uh, and its solutions within cybersecurity that cover quite a broad range of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of services that they, uh, that they actually offer. Right? It's really within, uh, within supply chain, without, uh, within, um, uh, within manufacturing. So it's really a broad uh, spectrum of where cybersecurity is applied and where those trailblazers have uh, solutions. So, I hope to have a good, uh, a good connection, uh, connection uh, now, and that no one has hacked the uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the the connection bec because both of them, uh, the, the three of them, um, uh, do that remotely, and every uh, each of them has exactly five minutes, and I will be very harsh on that because because I want to keep uh, to keep the the, the time. So firstly, um, if I may start with, uh, with Adi Hot from uh, Valotix. Uh, Adi, can you see us? Can you hear us? Hello. Hello? Yes. Um, Good morning. This is Stephen. Yeah, from TS1 Networks. Uh, from uh, yeah, well then uh, then let's uh, le let's move on uh, let's move on to to you, uh, Stephen. Uh, so Stephen from TX One Networks from from Taipei. Then let's start um, uh, with you if if, if the c uh, connection is so. So the I would say straight away the floor is yours and you have exactly five uh, minutes. All right, all right. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, Please. So um, since it's five minutes, I'm going to start it right now. Okay. Um, my name is Steven Su. I'm based in Taiwan. Uh, I'm a product, uh, senior product marketing director in TS1 Network. I've been working for cybersecurity for 20 years. Um, so today is a great opportunity to have this chance to introduce what TS1 Network doing, okay, or what kind of solution we'll provide, okay. So um, give me some background about the TS1 Network. Actually, we are a startup company. We were founded in 2019, okay. It's the joint venture company between the Chen Michael and Mosa. Both of them are based in Taiwan uh, with different domain expertise. Chen Michael has more than 30 years of cybersecurity experience and Mosa uh, also with 30 years of uh, OT network expertise. So we combine both company uh, strengths and establish the solution specifically designed for the manufacturer cybersecurity or also provide a solution for critical infrastructure. So um, our mission is to try to combine those solutions, brand it into the ICS uh, uh, environment. Okay, so the idea is kind of different from the IT cybersecurity. So our slogan is keep operation running, which means our solution, uh, the fundamental idea is not in, intuitive. Actually, as we uh, make sure the manufacturer can operate normally. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, philosophy when we decide this cybersecurity solution. So uh, the position, okay, uh, I'll compare this one with the Chen Michael's solution offering. Uh, as you might know, Chen Michael is specialized in IT cybersecurity. Okay, so based on Purdue model on the left hand side, they are more focused on level four and five. That will be enterprise security, also the uh, for the side business planning, that kind of environment. And TS1 network, we focus on Purdue model level three below, which means we are uh, focused on SCADA system, HMI system, POC, engineer station, specifically decided uh, for the manufacturing environment. So our solution combine different kind of uh, components, including endpoint and network, also inspection. Later on, I'll give you some background about that. So 
Um, we already engage more than thousand different um, manufacturers. Okay, so we learn their culture. We also understand the IT cybersecurity cannot apply in OT environment. Okay, so basically we find out five major elements, and that's the best practice for the IC cybersecurity resilience. Okay, the first one is network segmentation because in the OT environment, okay, a flat network, okay. So there's no isolation, no segmentation, which means the virus go inside is going to spread over the uh, entire plant. Okay. Also virtual patch, because they have large amount of the outdated operating system. Also application is not up to date. So you can imagine that there's a lot of vulnerability in there. So in order to uh, prevent the unknown attack, usually, uh, Adopting the trust list, no matter in the network side or endpoint side, actually you can avoid that kind of attack. Also, most importantly, it doesn't require regular update, which means in the adult manufacturing environment, it's difficult to connect to the internet to get update. So also uh, you have to consider the heart and your critical asset. Um, the critical asset definition is if this system go down, it's going to jeopardize your production that you consider is critical asset. And which means it's going to cause a lot of damage if actually the asset gets some damage. Of course, the, the last one, but none of this, you have to do the regular inspection. Okay, so we also provide the uh, solution, allow the operation uh, owner be able to do the regular inspection. So give me more detail about the segmentation. Why is so important? Okay, this is the typical example. We use the submarine as example. So with the segmentation, if a water leak inside, still can maintain his force. Yes, uh, 20 seconds. We love yes. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through this one. And virtual patch is more like the thing, uh, actually you can upgrade your system and mask is more about virtual patch, okay? So the solution we're offering is for the security inspection, endpoint protection and network defense, okay? Um, the detail about the solution here, okay, our endpoint protection can protect in the uh, ICS endpoint, including the modern line operating system, also legacy operating system. Network defense, we have different form factor. You can deploy into the shop floor. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your time is up. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, um, I'm going to finish the, the presentation uh, on, uh, today. Um, if you want more information, can you contact me directly? Also, can get the deck uh, from the uh, uh, organization. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the for the presentation. Thank you very 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 much, uh, Stephen. So. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's move on to the to the to the second uh, presentation. Let's stay in uh, in Taipei with uh, Chad Duffy from Cycraft. Chad, can you uh, hear us? Can you see us? Yes, we're ready. We're ready to present. Good uh, good morning. Good uh, or good, good morning. afternoon. So uh, well, just uh, you have five minutes. So the floor, floor is yours. Without further ado, okay. please. Uh, great. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen real quick. Make sure it's sharing okay here. Yes. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, hi. I'm Chad Duffy, a director at SciCraft, and we prevent, detect, and respond to breaches with AI, and I'll start us off with a little story. So SciCraft discovered a new advanced persistent threat group, which was covered by Wired and is very emblematic of modern sophisticated threats. And this is the story of two companies that face that threat. Um, company A was our customer and went unscathed, and Company B used a competitor uh, and, however, was uh, less fortunate. Attackers were inside for over a year and sold sub substantial intellectual property. So to better understand these outcomes, let's dig into the problem. Attackers are highly skilled. We've seen attackers launch from well-known cloud providers, use forged AV certificates, and living off the land techniques, making them very hard for others to detect quickly. Modern, sophisticated attackers can break through multi-layered defenses. Adding more layers is not the solution. On the other side, defenders face high friction to value. Current solutions are very manual, requiring a complex UI with modules, lots of them, and manual work, querying, linking, and triaging. Then you might think, oh, what about managed services? But managed services are essentially humans using complex tools with a lot of communication overhead. Again, not the greatest solution. Um, so that brings us to rethink the security stack with SciCraft Solutions. Our solution is a combination of technologies focused on end results. 
Our core proprietary technologies are two automated AI-based platforms, which are our threat intelligence platform, CyberTotal, and our forensic investigation platform, Cycarrier. Threats are detected and blocked on the network with ThreatWall. And continuous forensics are run across the internal customer site based on Zensor EDR. Our idea is to bring users to immediate value. Uh, for example, they don't need to worry about threat intel. We vet it, screen it, correlate it, collate it, and implement solutions on the network. On the endpoints, users don't need to worry about incident validation, triage, investigation as we automate this. And here's a glimpse of our AI at work with investigations and in threat intelligence space on the top and our full site forensic investigations on the bottom. And these are some examples of our end customer reporting. The cyber situation report is an automated forensic analysis over your entire organization with full attack storyline and root cause analysis, all affected assets and malware, C2, everything you need to understand, remediate and report any incident. Uh, we also have asset analysis and proactive threat hunting reporting. Um, ThreatWall offers reports on blocked indicators from threat intel. So to sum up, our deliverables are essentially what it takes to stop a modern APT. This user experience is different from Sentinel-1 and CrowdStrike, our top two competitors, and they're very manual. So two ways of looking at us versus them are, instead of the, from the endpoint perspective, we come from the digital forensics incident response space. So we see cybersecurity fundamentally as a, you know, a data science issue with our fast, accurate, simple, thorough user experience. Or you can kind of think of us as like threat graph from CrowdStrike plus more automation and AI from Sentinel-1 plus a lot more AI minus kind of a poor uh, UX and legacy tech issues. Um, again, simply said, uh, we're better to end results faster and we are gaining momentum in the industry with recent coverage from Gartner and uh, I report and came on IDC just this month. Um, but probably the most important recognition outside of our customers is our MITRE attack eval results, which are the gold standard here. We have the highest signal to noise ratio for the past two rounds. Our automation provides the most accurate automated solution available, which means uh, better end results more quickly. And a case study with a top four fabulous semiconductor resulted in huge reductions in time and manpower usage. And in Taiwan, where we're from, uh, we're number one in many industries, and we've expanded regionally to Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and we even have a customer in Jamaica. Um, the upper right, you can see we got a five-star Gartner peer review uh, from a Fortune 500 firm. And our business model is B2B to be subscription services and our market size is huge and we have great customer satisfaction and 37 patents in multiple countries and this is our exponential revenue growth. So why Europe? Um, fundamentally, you know, ransomware and APT threats are very much on the rise and we see that, you know, defenders do need better to get better end results faster. And then also the growing geopolitical risk issue is another major concern for the Western world. And in Taiwan, uh, we found that the Western, uh, many Western solutions were not able to stop the type of threat that we were facing. So that's, that's the solution was born. And so last but not least, here's the team of you know, serial entrepreneurs and PhDs uh, making the world more secure. So everything starts from security. Everything starts from SciCraft. Thank you. You can learn more at our website or read on our blog how we recently were able to uh, be, be quite, uh, do quite well against the Prometheus ransomware and Conti ransomware. We have new uh, techniques against that. And thank you very much for your time. Hey, startups. Did you know it's the perfect time to put Luxembourg on your radar? Propel your business to the next level in the very heart of Europe and take advantage of a fast-growing startup ecosystem, an international and business-friendly environment, easy access to corporate decision-makers and public authorities with a clear digital focus. Start to build your international team now. As a company with international ambitions, being based in Luxembourg comes with quite a few benefits. Luxembourg is a very international place with people being international minded, speaking multiple languages, but also the geographic situation offers an easy access to many European countries. People say you can't bring top talent into Luxembourg. You absolutely can. The small scale actually helps us bring some of the most amazing talent. And sometimes it can be way less competitive than some of the biggest European hubs. Luxembourg is your perfect gateway into European markets. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you, Frederick. So the next presentation is entitled New Frontiers in Data Privacy, and this is presented by David Dapp, National Technology Officer for Belgium and Luxembourg at Microsoft. Please give a warm welcome to David Dapp. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, actually, I want to cover two things here, right? By, by new frontiers, I mean two things, new, new boundaries uh, in the sense of exploring new territories, but also actual boundaries, new type of boundaries to protect data and, and, and privacy. Um, 
Let me start with the beginning. We all know that data is highly valuable. Um, you can see here a few pictures from the web, and it's often, you know, compared to oil, it's not exactly quite oil, but, you know, people uh, use that metaphor. Sometimes crown jewels are valuable things, and it's also valuable uh, from a privacy uh, uh, standpoint, and we had a presentation before, and everybody agrees that data, therefore, must be protected. And, and what is the mental model that we tend to have for data protection? And this is a picture coming from you know, a cybersecurity website, and you can find many similar pictures. It's the fortress model, right? You put the data in the middle, and you put layers and layers of walls and controls and guards so that nobody can actually get access to the data. That's a type of mental layered model we have to protect uh, the data. Um, well, there is only uh, uh, some problem with those analogy, and, and the first problem is that, you know, it's not like quite gold, right? The, the value of data is in its usage. I mean, you get more value by using the data, sharing the data, combining the data uh, with other data to do more use cases, right? Uh, and, you know, with big models and machine learning, it's actually quite critical to have access to large data set. And if you look from a geopolitical point of view, from a demographic point of view, uh, well, Europe is small uh, versus China versus India and so on, right? So the challenge we have here is to find a way to protect data from an economic standpoint, from a privacy standpoint, while being able to also uh, do the good thing uh, we can do uh, with data. And, and that's basically the topic uh, of my, my presentation today. Um, how do we need to tackle that issue? Basically, uh, three points that I would like to address. First, we need to have a risk-based approach. I will briefly touch upon that. Uh, two, we need to enrich our vocabulary. Uh, we tend to have a, a rather poor vocabulary to make distinction between different types of situations that call for different approach. And then uh, the main point is that we need to consider a broader set of type of boundaries and frontiers. And here, uh, luckily, technology is bringing uh, new stuff uh, on the table. Let's first start with um, uh, risk-based approach. It's pretty obvious. Uh, it's humanly impossible to uh, address all potential risks from the smallest to the most important one, and therefore, we need to ask questions like, uh, what are my most valuable assets? Uh, what is the threat model? Uh, what are my objectives, my policy? What do you want to achieve? How can I achieve that? And so on and so on. Unless we do that, uh, we would address all risk in an you know, unprioritized way and typically leave big holes uh, uh, open. The second point, and it's an important one, is to use a richer vocabulary. And, and you know, everybody knows the, 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 the Eskimo apparently have a lot of different words for snow, and obviously snow and ice is very important for them, and they have different words for, you know, uh, falling snow and snow on the ground and drifting snow and so on and so on. When we talk about, you know, uh, uh, digital sovereignty, for example, or personal data, uh, we need more granular words. Uh, let me take digital sovereignty, for instance. You know, it can mean many different things, uh, and therefore many different objectives, many different, you know, reason why it is important, it can be strategic autonomy, it can be economical reason, it can be, you know, uh, so society, democracy, uh, trust in institution. There are many different sub-aspects here, and it's important to be precise, because if we don't know what we want to defend, well, we may uh, uh, miss the target. From a personal data point, you cannot read here, but, you know, if you think about GDPR, I mean, it, it, it's kind of not rich enough vocabulary. You have like personal data and non-personal data. You know, if you take an email, for instance, you have the body, obviously personal data. Uh, you have the, the email address. Well, also, you have the IP address. Yes, technically, they are all personal data, but obviously, they are not quite the same and may call different approach from a, 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 a risk management point of view. If you think about cloud, it's the same thing. If uh, you put a database or a virtual machine in the cloud, you have the customer information in the virtual machine, but you have also diagnostic data, billing information, IP address, and so on, which technically can be personal data, but obviously are of a different nature. So we need a richer vocabulary. Then we need to consider uh, multiple boundary models, right? Different ways to protect data and, and, and encapsulate data, if you wish. Uh, and you have different ways to do that. While well, you have like crypto cryptographic way, you have geographical ways, you have hardware boundaries, you have many more boundaries. And depending on the situation, depending on uh, what wants to achieve, 
a combination or different combinations of boundaries uh, uh, can be considered to achieve the, the objectives. Again, not, not just the fortress model, right? It's, it's richer than that. Now, let me switch to the new da data boundary types that are emerging from a technology point of view. And uh, before I do that, uh, let's spend a bit of time on the tensions and the objectives that you know, a DPO, a CISO, I mean, uh, executive teams face in protecting data. There are actually different objectives. You have availability of data, obviously, uh, you know, business resilience, and so on and so on. And you know, uh, generally speaking, there is a general agreement that uh, cloud is, is a very good way to achieve that. I mean, thanks to the scale stack, to the automation, cloud is, usually is much better than on-prem for availability. Uh, there are exceptions, uh, very low latency and so on, but generally speaking, it's a, a, a good way to achieve those objectives. Security, obviously, uh, uh, cloud is being increasingly recognized as the way to go versus uh, many on-prem things for all the, the points we discussed before. Uh, human error, access to competency, skill staff, and so on and so on. Again, thanks to the scale, thanks to the resources devoted on that, and thanks to the automation, the human factor, because in a cloud environment, a lot of things are automated and therefore far less uh, human errors on which you know, threat sophisticated actors uh, uh, thrive. Then uh, also need to think about compliance, uh, regulation, norms, and again, uh, very often the cloud is, is a, a, a good way to achieve those objectives because take a typical hyperscale, you know, uh, will conform with hundreds of norms, hundreds, thousands of controls, and you know, once it's implemented for a specific subset of customer, for instance, of an industry, you know, everybody can benefit, right? Also, thanks to automation, less error, uh, easier auditability, and so on. So automation can help uh, achieve compliance by design and, and, and by automation. And then you cannot see uh, uh, the yellow um, circle there. Uh, I've named it confidentiality. It's actually more specific. It's, you know, extraterritorial uh, uh, warrants, like Cloud Act and things like that, where, you know, if, for instance, in the case of the US, if you work with a US company, or if yourself are a US company, I mean, you are exposed to getting warrants from uh, US authorities, criminal uh, justice, very specific. It's actually very rare. We can get back to that, but the risk exists. So that creates a tension because the natural tendency for that, we say, oh, we're gonna be local, we're going to make sure that it's going to be uh, sovereign, that, you know, in the case of the U.S., we don't touch a, a subprocessor that is U.S. We don't have any uh, con contamination, so to speak, with a U.S. entity, and therefore we're going to be immune uh, to, to that risk, which, again, is very small. In the case of Microsoft, we publish uh, how many requests uh, we get, where at the end of the day we give uh, a customer data. It's typically two per year worldwide. So it's very, it exists, but it's very small. Certainly very small versus or the other risk, so how do you balance that tension between I want to stay local to prevent a risk, but you know, maybe I have to give up on, on other benefits. And this is where new model uh, uh, come in, new technology, uh, and I would like to first talk about uh, confidential uh, computing, uh, trusted execution environment, and then I will say some brief words about another boundary model, which is more on the compliance uh, point. So let's start with confidential computing thing, what is it? Uh, well, it's basically adding a layer to what will we have. We have uh, uh, encryption for data at rest, you know, it's the norm. Um, you have data in transit is encrypted also by default, HTTPS is the norm, so all of that is, is very common. What is new is that, no, it's possible to keep the data encrypted or inaccessible when it's used, and that's really new. Uh, from a technology point of view, you have like homomorphic encryption. However, it's uh, not ready yet uh, for uh, industrial deployment. It's way too expensive in computational power. But there are other ways to do that, and it's the, uh, for instance, the um, confidential computer or trusted execution environment. Briefly, how does that work? You have your data, you encrypt the data, you have your code, you encrypt the code, and you send that in a piece of hardware, it's highly simplified here, which is this yellow box, where nobody can see what happens in the box. The operating system cannot see what's in the box, the uh, uh, hypervisor cannot see in the box, and when the data arrive in the box, when the code arrives in the box, it's attested, make sure it has not been tampered with, then if it's okay, it's put in clear, calculation goes on, and the result is encrypted and sent back out of the box. And nobody can see what happens in the box. Whether the box is here, in another geography, with a cloud provider, anywhere, 
the box is a new boundary. It's a hardware boundary yeah, when you can run things safely. This technology is available, it's being used, it's progressing at high speed. Um, it has been out there for a, a number of years, but it's really getting mature. We have like industrial deployment, RBC is one uh, uh, signal, uh, the uh, messaging uh, platform which you know which actually is used by a cyber security team when there's an incident to make sure they have a safe channel um, are using uh, this type of solution this type of new boundaries so that's something really to 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 follow uh, also because it's going to open an entire new uh, economy of data and model where different parties can put their data in common in that environment without allowing the other party to see the data, but being able to use the data. So that, that opens new way to protect the data while keeping uh, uh, the scale, right? Access to large data sets. So it's something, something to follow for sure. And that can be used already in specific uh, uh, use case and scenario. Very briefly, other type of boundaries that can help here uh, make the trade-off. EU data boundary, this is more on the compliance uh, side. Uh, we, Microsoft, have announced uh, recently that uh, we are, are implementing EU boundary by the end of next year, where not only, which is already the case today, our customer data are uh, in stay in Europe at all time, that's already the case today, but even the diagnostic data, you know, all these technical messages in the cloud, which are not quite the customer data, but technically speaking, from a GDPR point of view, uh, can be recognized. Today, we are already compliant. Uh, we have uh, uh, obviously pseudonymization, aggregation, and, and, and all of that. But that requires organization DPOs to uh, make a transfer assessment because some of these data are transferred. We are basically going to strongly reduce, almost reduce to zero, uh, those transfers by making sure that everything stays in Europe, including help desk. Today, we have help desks that follow the sun. All the team, 24 by 7, will be in Europe to make sure that even someone who touched the data sees the data, because seeing the data is, is a transfer of data under GDPR, everything stays in Europe, and that's going to come uh, end of the next year. So in summary here, what I wanted to do is that to pass a few messages. Uh, it's very important to, to we protect data for multiple reasons, economic, geopolitical, privacy. Um, that's very important. In order to do that, we need to have a risk-based approach. Uh, very important, we need to have a rich vocabulary to be granular and make distinction between different types of situations uh, so that we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach, back to the risk-based uh, uh, approach. And uh, new technology uh, bring new type of boundaries, cryptographic hardware boundary that allow to protect data uh, uh, in different ways, like the uh, confidential computed and the trusted execution environment. And in terms of compliance, uh, we are int introducing this EU data boundary, uh, which will make the life of DPOs simpler because there will be no transfer anymore, except in a very particular area like security, because obviously the criminals don't know frontiers. And if you want to fight against uh, criminals and, and others, uh, well, you need to have like the full view on what they are doing to pick the right signal. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great intervention, David. Um, this concludes our first session, which was about data security, everyone's businesses. And before we follow with the second session, that will be the new era of Zero Trust, uh, we are going to have a short advertisement break.
to cope with crisis and difficulties, to be warned about threats and dangers, to evaluate and manage the risks each storm brings, to be expertly guided in an increasingly digital world, nothing is more important than a solid and trustworthy partner. With EBRC, you can face uncertainty with complete peace of mind. EBRC, your trusted ICT partner. So for the next topic, the new era of zero trust, we have the chance to welcome Christoph Rupert, who is experienced and reliable business continuity management expert, practice lead with proven track record of success at EBRC, as well as Jose F. Correa, Chief Administration Officer, CISO, Business Continuity Manager at IHAP. They are here to explain us how to step out the zero trust zone. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you very much. So how to step out of the zero trust zone? I am Christophe Rupert. I'm uh, the practice lead in business continuity management, as you said uh, before. And uh, my expertise is uh, around the ISO, the latest standard in place, which is the ISO 22301. My name is, uh, my name is Jose Correa. I am a Chief Administration Officer at uh, IUP, CISO, and uh, Business Continuity Coordinator. So let me just share with you a few words about IUP. Uh, IUP is the operator of the first centralized KYC reposit repository uh, for ongoing due diligence in Europe. It facilitates the updates and reviews of KYC files for professionals through its innovative partner solution. So KYC Partner is a revolutionary outsourcing service managed solution for banks, asset managers, transfer agents, insurers, and PFS, and any other regulated companies subject to AML laws. So through our KYC repository and outsourcing model, we are on a mission to help our clients to reduce operational risks Improve due diligence efficiency, ease the data gathering process, a better end-to-end -end client experience, reduce the costs, improve time to market to onboard new business relationships, and be able to adapt quickly to, uh, to evolving compliance rules and regulations. Okay. My turn, Jose. Thank you. About EBRC, so uh, we are very specialized in, in uh, monitoring and to manage the sensitive data in the Grand, in, in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. And uh, we, in our portfolio, we are uh, some several keywords as advisory, managed services, cloud, uh, cybersecurity, business continuity, and data centers. So. What we aim to do is to design, to protect. So uh, let's move forward. Jose, in uh, 2019, you asked me to support you in designing an efficient business continuity, uh, continuity management system, a BCMS. There are a lot of questions around that people should have in mind. Jose, could you explain to us your posture regarding BCMS and what was the trigger to engage this kind of business continuity management system within HiHub? Sure, so some components were already existing back then and in place. Uh, relocation tests, 
uh, reports, uh, procedures and policies, uh, but not ISO-like formatted nor formalized. So we had no internal ISO experience uh, for the implementation of the standard. So where to start? Uh, how can I make sure that the business and the IT work efficiently together? And uh, how to involve uh, our partners? So back then, EBRC was already um, providing high up with, resi with uh, resilience uh, seats uh, and was hosting the platform KYC partner. So very naturally, uh, that's how uh, we selected EBRC as a trusted partner, uh, part of post uh, Luxembourg Cybersecurity uh, Task Force. Okay, so my very first comment would be, what are the key advantages of the ISO 22301 for an organization? So back to the slides now. So to, is to provide a very good protection for your employees, to have an effective response in terms of crisis, to improve and to develop a competitive advantage, to better understand your critical activities as an, as an assurance, to better understand your organization, to uh, have a very good protection in terms of brand and reputation, and uh, to improve, which could be the main uh, principal part of this presentation, uh, the, to improve the confidence of uh, every stakeholders you have uh, in the company, and to be aligned for sure with the regulatory and the compliance thing. So, Jose, question for you. Within the IOP context, what was the trigger to get ISO 22301 and 27K, ISO 27K certification? Sure. The first thing, uh, trust. So, to reassure the stakeholders, uh, the, uh, the clients, uh, the regulator, uh, the shareholders. And um, back then, a due diligence was ongoing, uh, started with a client, by a client, uh, on IT security. So we, we established the, the Aziz situation and uh, determined uh, what was the delta missing for the uh, certification to ISO 27001 uh, standard. On, on the BCMS, on the business continuity management um, system that we did not have yet in place, but the procedures and policies, uh, what we did is basically the same. Uh, we established uh, the roadmap on what was in place and what was necessary to achieve the implementation of uh, the ISO standard 22301. So basically a gap analysis uh, started the whole process. And this ISO certification gives us an efficient client relation start. That's what we identified. Easier answers to call for tenders and uh, an advantage on the competition. So understanding the organization was a keyword, uh, business impact analysis, or so the BIAs that we did together with uh, all the departments, and to better understand uh, their, their needs, their constraints, uh, and also their dependencies. So I found uh, in, in, in EBRC methodology a, a framework uh, that could allow us to efficiently implement the ISO 22301 standard. Thank you very much, Jose. So shall we speak about the methodology you speak about by design, which is the EBRC methodology? Yes, please do. Thank you. So it's all about converting and understanding the latest standard, which is the ISO 22301, into a very understandable methodology. So how best to convert this business continuity standard into the right methodology by uh, design? ISO 22301 tends to position a risk-based approach perspective in, ident in identifying the major threats you want to protect from. It means you should be aware of every pillars, for instance, IT security management, IT service management, records management, the quality of the process you have to deliver to your final customers, health and safety management, supply chain, in order to uh, better understand your criticality regarding your suppliers and the environment part. Um, the aim of this framework, and this is very key because the ISO 22301 is seen as a masterpiece. Uh, the aim of, of this framework is to understand the risks 
of the unplanned and negative deviation from the expected delivery of product and services according to an organization objective. So question again for you, Jose, within the business continuity management system within HiHub, what kind of information could you share with us? Well, I thought the BCMS or the business continuity management system as an orchestrator, uh, a centralizer uh, up to the supplier's relationship, the re supplier's management. So this approach has allowed us to improve the risk treatment methodology for the whole company. Um, it eased and accelerated the 27,001 certification, uh, while the urgency measures, uh, the assessment of the critical supplier's resilience, uh, incident management, risk management, um, how to respond much faster to pandemic situation like we leave it now. So the ISO 22301 has a link to the 27001, uh, structuring lever for improvement for risk framework, for risk management. Uh, 22301 uh, risk assessments have driven the whole global risk analysis into 27001. Okay, so the very next question is how best to start with the ISO 22301. So can I ask you how was the impl implementation project running within high hop context and how complex it was to do that? Well, again, I uh, a, a very young company at that time, uh, back in 2018-19. Uh, it had early stage plans, procedures, policies in place. But the gap analysis you advised us to starting uh, of the project gave us the necessary uh, confidence that the target could be uh, reachable. So we have more and more uh, requirements on the regulatory world. Uh, it eases us to prepare the audits and eventually also inspections. Uh, one needs to know how far to go. Uh, it, uh, it, it's up to the level of detail that you want uh, to deep into and to avoid any unnecessary uh, complexity. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. So if I well understood, it's all about the question of granularity regarding uh, the modelization of your activities, interdependency, your resources, the risk, and to me, it is crucial that the top, very top management is leading this kind of project because uh, that's, it has to be a top management driven project. So in a few words, Jose, could you identify the main key benefits on this project for HiHub? Sure. Uh, the key benefit for HiHub is uh, the reconciliation of the internal IT, the IT um, uh, suppliers, and uh, with the identified uh, needs of the business through the business impact analysis, so the BIAs. Okay, so if I understood well, if we start off with a uh, gap an, uh, analysis, this is a good starting point. That's correct. Okay, so at EBOC, what we developed so far is a tool set which allows you to have uh, a very good understanding of your posture regarding your business continuity level or maturity level. So we try to, to uh, define and to develop is to uh, have a very straightforward approach regarding this gap analysis from the BIA part. Uh, and we have to go through every single component, management commitment, the policy, roles, resources, competencies, awareness until the business continuity plans and the procedures uh, also the exercises and testing part, which allows you to identify if you validate all the analysis you did so far. So it has to be a very, uh, very good quick win to move forward with a very clear remediation and an action plan to improve your maturity level in terms of business continuity. So thank you very much. If you want to go further, uh, we uh, uh, have a white paper to read and uh, we can um, suggest you to complete an online auto assessment tool that's free, that uh, costs just 10 minutes of your time and that's based on the latest standard ISO 22301 and you get a report and you will get our 
expertise uh, regarding the outcomes you could have. So please ask us to be notified and this uh, online auto assessment tool will be available very soon, maybe next uh, week. I think so. so thank you very much. Jose, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, very great to have this chat with you, this conversation and the opportunity again to speak about business continuity and ISO 22301. Thank you. If you have any question about that, I hope you are well, very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you, Christoph and Joseph, for this uh, presentation. Uh, we will now welcome our next guest, who joined REA Group in December 2020 as Chief uh, European Institutions Officer and Manager Director for REA System Luxembourg SA. He was behind the creation and subsequent development of two subsidiaries at the SES, namely SES Techcom and Redu Space Services, and has been involved in various international projects. He will give us an overview of the critical role of cybersecurity in space applications and programs. Uh, so please welcome Pascal Rogues. <laughs> So good, good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending this, this session. In this session, I would like to make a bridge between uh, what was discussed in this room uh, yesterday morning in the Space Forum and what we are discussing today about cybersecurity. Because uh, as you will see, there is a strong convergence between the two domains. And uh, this is what we want, I wanted to address today and uh, in the context, in a general context, first of all, and in a, a RIA context afterwards. Um, so what about the, the context of, of cybersecurity for space application? This is really something which is threatening the space application very much uh, as, as we know them. And let me share you not my vision, but the vision of uh, key stakeholders in the domain. So first of all, the European Space Agency, ESA. Um, and then I will share the, the vision of the European Commission, uh, which is also endorsing more and more space programs. But at ESA, they, they recently, over the last years, already over the last four to five years, realized that the space programs are increasing, increasing in size, in pace, in uh, rapidity of development. Um, in this room, your concert uh, experts yesterday announced that there will be up to uh, 1,000 launch of satellite over the next years to come. Uh, and this is constituting a lot of deployment of space systems. And uh, so the, the domain is becoming attractive. The, the domain is very valuable. Uh, of course, you know that investments are high in space activities. And where money is, uh, cyber threats are coming up. That's, uh, you cannot avoid that. Um, so there is an increasing interest for cyber attackers uh, to, to look at space uh, system. And uh, space system has also have also involved. In the past, we knew space system as big infrastructure investment, uh, satellites which were deployed uh, up to two hundred million dollars uh, per satellite launched. This 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 era is over now. We are in the new space domain. You you know that better than me. Um, but still. We are in space systems which are highly dependent on space infrastructure, but which are more and more linked to a system, an end-to-end -end approach where IT is key now. Uh, space applications is uh, driving our today's world into, in terms of navigation, Earth observation, uh, telecommunication, of course. Uh, but actually, none of us here in the room care about which type of satellite is used. We just care about the application the end-to-end -end application and the usage we do for that. And at the end of the day, it's those applications are delivered to us and onto IT infrastructure, up to the cloud infrastructure. So space is not, on, not anymore alone out there. It's an entire IT ecosystem that we have to protect when we talk about uh, application. 
And because of this IT element, uh, there is a huge weakness or, or, or threats that is coming up, which was not there in two-space application in the past. Um, and the threat are, are, address and are addressing a lot of component into the space system. Uh, people may tempt it to attack not only the space segment, not only the ground segment, but also the links, and especially the communication links of the space system. And each of those building blocks constitute a weakened point uh, that we have to address and that we have uh, to protect. And a big element of uh, threat in the, in the new space system also is that the ground system, which, were, which used to be heavy, big antennas, hardware deployment, this is, this is over now. This, we are coming to an, an era of a ground system and ground segment virtualization. Uh, those big hardware in the, of the past are now replaced by as a service ground segment. Uh, and then you realize re easily the IT component of that and the threatening element of that. So this is the vision by, by ESA, and I will show later what they have decided to do about this. But the same concern is, is also addressed by the European uh, Commission and the European institution. Um, heavy relying on space investment and deploying space investment. They did Galileo, they did Copernicus for the Earth observation. They heavily in, are considering investing into a European uh, constellation for satellite communication, which would be EU proprietary. Uh, so they are really aggressive into deploying space segment. But they really believe that cybersecurity is not addressed enough into those uh, space segments. And this is weakening the entire uh, position and the entire uh, investments. And uh, just to underline that, uh, earlier this year, in January 2021, there was a huge international space conference. And I just here relay the title of that space conference, uh, which was looking at space embracing a changing world. But the, the four keywords, out of the four keywords which were underlying the priority of European Commission when they consider space, uh, out of the four, two mentioned resilience and security. Just to, uh, to show that security is really a hot topic now, and cybersecurity, of course, for the European institution when they consider uh, space uh, programs. And just a, just a fact, which is not only related to space, but it, which is general of all. Uh, when we look at cybersecurity and issues you know, on a worldwide basis, not only including space, but you see that actually 86% of the breaches, cybersecurity breaches, have been motivated by financial uh, reasons. And only 10% of that, that are what you use to, to call the espionage uh, breaches, uh, but now people are out there to earn money uh, by attacking people. <clears throat> and, uh, and this is putting at risk a lot of records, even personal records. We addressed that in, in, earlier in, in the previous sessions. Uh, and of course, this is an overall context that we have to anticipate and to address. So which actions have been taken by those key stakeholders in the in the domain. At ESA level, up to five years ago, they have decided the, the, the cybersecurity concern was so urgent and were, was so stringent that they created a dedicated ESA security office, reporting directly to the CEO of, of ESA, to the director general. And they have established a roadmap and a strategy for ESA security uh, strategy with the goal of making sure that all the investment and the space investments of the member states would be protected and that all the applications that you use on a daily basis are also uh, protected. Of course, this does not go without investment. Uh, two key pillars or two pillars of investment of ESA have been made and decided. One uh, is a center of excellence of cybersecurity which is located not far from here, in, in Redu, in Belgium. Uh, at RIA Group, we were, we were pleased to be awarded that contract for setting up this center of excellence. And there is another infrastructure which is coming up, which is, which is going to be an operational one for 
a SOC, what they call a C-SOC in the case of ESA, uh, for monitoring on a continuous basis the, the space applications. And also at, at EU level, uh, the push for cybersecurity. Um, but it's interesting that they see, and it's very related to what Alexander mentioned uh, in the previous session, uh, they don't see cybersecurity as a defending aspect at European level. It's not a defense. Of course, it is, it is a defense, but it's really something that you need in order to build up a digital trust. And without a digital trust, you may do and you may deploy whatever you want. Users will not use your system if they do not believe they are, they are uh, taken care of. Uh, so cybersecurity is, is a, a, a key element but it's more than anything else an enabler to the digitalization, as we know them uh, on non-space applications, but also in, into uh, space applications. And this is really something which is pushed forward by the European uh, Commission. And uh, I mean, given my past five years as CEO of Luxtros, I would not deny that digital trust is a very key uh, element. Um, so what do we do at, at RIA for addressing this? Um, definitely we see cyber at the core element. If you look at this uh, like, like an onion shape, the core of the onion is, is the cyber security. You can build up whatever you would like uh, if you don't have the cyber in order to make sure that your, your application uh, are, are safe uh, and trusted, um, this, is, this is useless. Uh, but if you do it right, you have a big impact on society, thanks to space application. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over, again, this, the SATCOM, the navigation and observation application that we use to, to use every, every day, and which uh, we will come to that. Thanks also to the initiative taken in Luxembourg, we will uh, more and more use and develop here in the, in the local ecosystem. Um, so to address cybersecurity concerns, of course, uh, the people that we are facing, institutions, commercial organizations, they have different level of maturities in cybersecurity. So in order to address them well, we have to have a, a span of portfolio which is addressing the entire value chain. And this starts with advisory services, this starts also with products and, and cyber ranges, for example. Uh, which allow those people to test their environment or validate their environment, um, up to uh, infrastructures which are 24 by 7 securing uh, their uh, space applications. And this uh, covering of the coverage of the full value chain is materialized uh, as we speak by two SOCs that we have uh, within the RIA group, one in Redu at the same place as the Center of Excellence of ESA, and, and one in Canada, which is uh, allowing us to cover on a 24 by 7 basis the European, but also international space applications which are relying on us. Yeah, sorry. So all this to say that um, at RIA Group, over the last 30 years, we mainly focus on serving and building trusted relationship with the institutions, government, uh, European, national institutions. Uh, this is definitely, I will come to that, what we want to do here in, in Luxembourg, uh, which give us now the opportunity to uh, claim that we have been trusted and we are trusted by uh, the key stakeholders in terms of organizations like the EU, the, like NATO and, uh, and ESA, for example, uh, for which we, we work. But also commercial uh, clients are, are, are relying on, on us. And uh, <clears throat> we have been awarded some uh, key projects into cybersecurity domain uh, very recently, uh, not only for ESA, as I mentioned, but also for Galileo. Uh, Galileo has a huge concern in terms of cybersecurity, especially now as they are talking about the next generation of Galileo. This is in the carton for them. Uh, so they are thinking about this, uh, but also commercial operators like Utilsat in Marsat, uh, they do rely on end-to-end -end application for, uh, that they commercialize and cybersecurity is an important uh, point for them. So project by project, service by service, we are, we are, have been addressing 
those, but the story is, is of course not, not over. Something which is very important and, and a tendency that we see is that um, there is more and more convergence between uh, cybersecurity, as we all know it, and, and physical security. Uh, organization out there, especially the ones who are not prepared, who have neglected the, the security aspect at any front, uh, are facing issues in physical security, access security, as well as they do in cybersecurity. Uh, so this is something where, uh, that, where we are now combining portfolios in physical security and, and cyber security in order to anticipate that, that convergence. So just a few words about the, the REA group in that, in that context. Um, we have been established now in, uh, in Luxembourg since end of last year. So it's less than, less than a year ago that we were pleased to uh, establish ourselves here in Luxembourg. Of course, myself, I've been working here for 20 years uh, at SES and then five years as the CEO of Luxtrust, so I know the, I know the landscape. Um, but just a few words about the RIA. It's a group of uh, about 650 people, 50 people, very active in terms of recruiting talent. Uh, we recruited more than 150 people just last year in, in COVID times. And uh, we are spread over 11 countries, mostly in, in, in Europe. Um, this, this is showing the, the spread over Europe. The reasons why we are located in those regions is to be close to the customers. Because although we are looking at the portfolio, which is a group portfolio, as I described it later on, uh, early on, uh, the local trust, the digital trust is important, but the local trust to your customer is, is also very important. And so you need to be locally next to, to your customer and your key stakeholder in order to, to build that up. And this is really what, uh, what we do. About the approach that we are, have been taken at, at, at RIA uh, and the management team, but I, I was not there, so it's all the credit of the of the management di managing director there. But at the level of the, the strategy, people are really at the core. We talked about a lot about skills, talents, uh, attracting talents, retaining talents. Uh, this is true for all of us. This is, of course, true for, for us. So we have put people at the core of the, of the strategy, um, where we feed them, especially the young people who need to be retained and attracted and, uh, and interested in what they do. Um, someone was mentioning that banking is boring, space is more exciting uh, in terms of applications. So we have a good, uh, good arguments to, to present when, when they come into RIA. Uh, but of course, those young talents and, and young engineers uh, men and women, you, you need to entertain them, you need to interest them. Uh, so we have a, a very active uh, strategy and, and thought about innovation, entering into new developments, uh, as, of course in this exciting group of and, and domain of, of cybersecurity and space for cybersecurity and space applications. Uh, but which something which is very important is to bring up and build up very uh, long-standing relationship with the key stakeholders. Um, competition for us is, is, is a good thing. Uh, it shows that we are addressing something uh, in a domain which is attracting, attracting to people, attracting for the economy, and that there are opportunities to create a very solid economy and an ecosystem. Uh, so we rely on that. Uh, and we like to have a vision which is not a one-by-one, case-by-case uh, basis, but which is a long-term one in order to sustain a, a long-standing relationship with the local authorities. In our, in our domain, we are, we are talking actively with the Ministry of Economy, with Security Made in EU, uh, in terms of cybersecurity, with the Luxembourg Space Agency also but also with local actors, because uh, I mean, they are part of the ecosystem. And if we have a strong ecosystem, we will all benefit from a strong ecosystem. N none of us benefit from a, a, a hard and harsh uh, competition. Um, 
I talked a lot about the, the cybersecurity portfolio. Of course, we are addressing all the domains of expertise. I'm not going, this is not the topic today, so I'm not going to go through that. Uh, but we are essentially an engineering company in space and uh, cybersecurity and security uh, system. And the bottom line is, is the, the growth of, of the group, which has been a 20-year compound over the last uh, year on year, over the last uh, years. Uh, so we started the year at 600 people today. Uh, we foresaw to reach 750 people at the end of this year. There are about 100 job openings uh, posted on, on, on the website. And, and this is really the, the fruit and, and the concretization of this long-term vision and trusted vision, which I believe is essential for the, for the DNA of the, of the company. So what, what the hell are we doing in Luxembourg? So um, because we have the big group, uh, uh, my vision when entering and, and coming to Luxembourg with, with RIA was not just to do a copy paste of what the group is doing elsewhere and just do the same thing here. Um, Luxembourg has a strong vision, has a strong strategy in space, has a strong strategy in cybersecurity. And those are opportunities to exploit, to build up. Um, with, with partners, with local stakeholders. But the focus that we are going to have here uh, at RIA Luxembourg is to build up recurring uh, engineering and operation services. So as you, meant, as you saw, we have a big group behind us, a lot of competencies. Our purpose is to build up building blocks in order to uh, create recurring services uh, from operated from within uh, Luxembourg, of course, in line with the strategy of space, in space and cybersecurity, which are uh, elaborated and, and driven by the, by the Ministry of Economy and the other ministries uh, in, in Luxembourg. Uh, but innovation is also key, as I mentioned. But innovation here is, has to be materialized, and this is the purpose of inter, in terms of building talent for the country for the economy and, and retaining them here uh, as high, high valuable resources that will benefit for the, for the future of us. So I thank you for your attention. I hope it, they, this gave you a, a, a good sense of the importance of cybersecurity uh, in, in Europe uh, for all of us and in, uh, on an international basis and how we collectively have to address that. Everything that I mentioned are opportunities to, to, to work to get together as we are doing with several clients and, and partners. Uh, so please don't hesitate to join us into the, into the venture. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, insights, Pascal. So the next intervention uh, is a specific session called uh, CISO Talk, and it has as an objective to uh, allow the audience, whether it's physically or remotely, to uh, get some insights from a chief information security officer. And today we have the chance to uh, count on the participation of Thomas Martin Kenas, the Director of Privacy and Security at Vinted, an online marketplace based in Lithuania for buying, selling and exchanging new or second-hand items, mainly clothing and accessories. So we are connecting to him right now. Hello, Thomas, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, nice to be there with you, virtually, but still. Nice to meet you. So do, do you want to uh, present your company, Vinted? Um, yeah, sure. So you actually, actually very well um, uh, put what, what we are doing um, in Vinted. Uh, it's an e-commerce company, but uh, you know it's very important to highlight the mission, uh, what we are doing. So I, I think it's... The, the, uh, these words of the mission describes the best what we are doing. So it's we we are on a mission to make second hand the first choice uh, worldwide. So I believe it's a very beautiful and uh, interesting mission we are on, and we are currently growing our community of more than um, fifty million users um, across the globe. So 
um, that's what we are doing. Um, yeah, you just said it that actually you have around 50 million users around the globe. Uh, so this is quite yeah. a vast amount of data. And uh, how is Vinted managing to protect uh, its uh, users' data? Yeah, so the, the number of members using our platform is astonishing, uh, but let, let me put that into a context, you know. As the first unicorn uh, of Lithuania, we have data centers locally, uh, and we alone generate more than 40% of all outgoing uh, internet traffic from Lithuania. Another example that on a peak hours, we can reach a few million uh, events per second. Such a throttle uh, pushes data storage hardware to get its limit in just a couple of days simply. Therefore, we need to take care of uh, privacy and security, but bring uh, reliable solutions as well. And when we think about our members, we think about the community. Together, we are on a mission to make secondhand the first choice worldwide. And members use the platform and provide us with their personal information, personal data. We treat that the data we get with the highest precaution. It's written in our DNA level that privacy is a fundamental human right. So we think um, about that in every decision we are making or very or every operation we are performing. Even though you know everybody in our organization is an information security officer, uh, it's written in our DNA, we can ensure a high maturity level uh, with a centralized capacity. We do have a trust and safety uh, team integrated in our uh, product structure. We have a privacy and security team working together on the infrastructure and organizational level supported by legal and compliance functions. And the support from top management and the capacity to deliver is not enough. We scale and grow uh, teams in line with the organizational growth. We not only try to keep up, uh, but devote ourselves to innovate and manage risks. And innovate not only in technology or processes, but also um, in an organizational setup. It is so that organization and communication lines topology defines the product itself, the product architecture. And we genuinely believe in this statement. And talking in general terms, when it comes to data management, the data governance team is responsible for the helicopter view. Data is like cars, trains, and bikes uh, commuting uh, in the streets between buildings, our systems. We care that the infrastructure is secure and efficient. We have analytics uh, working with the data, uh, but we also have engineers who manage the traffic. In other words, uh, provide a platform that meets uh, the requirements. We apply the segregation of duties principle on the organizational level. We keep it only to the need to know basis and we use privacy rules to, to the data like anonymization, retention, and so on. So to sum up uh, the answer, if you imagine Vinted uh, as a large city, awareness and culture uh, of security and privacy is where we spend our nights and innovation is what we do uh, on days. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, following with this a little bit, uh, we also know that Vinted is in uh, 15 countries. Uh, it is mainly here in Europe, but uh, you also have the United States, you have Canada, and this means that uh, you have to constantly be also dealing with like different regula regulatory frameworks. Uh, so you need to be moving also like that, like from the regulation in one country to another one, but also the type of user in one country to another one. Um, so in terms of that, what you were talking about, um, the data privacy and also the security, um, how do you adapt to these different environments, to these different, like being in those different countries? Mm, yeah, I, I could say there's no silver bullet for that. Uh, yes, we are working towards flexibility and we aim for the highest uh, maturity processes in the organization. Still, when, when we want to launch our product in a new market, the research and development team and our security engineers spend days and nights analyzing the environment. 
not only the business uh, side of it, but uh, even um, darknet and thread actors, for example. And we do that constantly. The same is for the members. We are running hundreds of A-B tests uh, continuously to understand members' experiences and improve uh, our product. It's not only that we want to understand uh, the market, but we also want to change it. It is essential from our business uh, nature, uh, from the mission on which we are, to educate our members as well about privacy and security as a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, something else we've been discussing uh, through this morning, all this thing about like uh, uh, finding talent, keeping talent. Uh, so for your organization, um, what are the qualities, the skills that you look uh, in someone when you are trying to hire for this cybersecurity or like in general security team? Yeah, very good question actually. And for a growing company like ours, it is essential to keep the growth level healthy. We are on the edge of uh, with, on the edge with the hiring uh, of security and privacy team to that matter as we need to grow our team 3x, uh, for example, close to 100 people. And we see the shortage of professional experts in the area as the whole world does. Nothing new in that uh, case. Still, we attract uh, the top talents uh, in Europe. And we are attracted to talents because of our mission and the technical challenges we are facing in the organization. Nevertheless, we are giving a lot back to the community, especially to students, uh, women in technology, and talents who are willing to invest and see themselves in a security area. We need to have various uh, variety of skills in the team to come to those innovative solutions. We need to fight uh, the constantly emerging threats with very innovative solutions. So we have engineers and process engineers, uh, lawyers, economists, designers, uh, analysts, product managers, even psychologists working to improve uh, security posture. And Across the company, uh, we identify at least a few skills that are written in our cultural book. It is, um, we grow, uh, we aim high, we co-create, and we care. These principles are shaping our culture and environment, and these are the skills uh, that we are searching for. Um, so let's stick to the em employees uh, for a second. Uh, I don't know if you followed the session this morning or just before that. Um, there were a lot of uh, discussions ar about awareness raising, how to assure that uh, the human flaw is minimalized in order to just to raise awareness that they don't click on every link. Um, do you have you have something around like 700 employees, if I'm not wrong? Do you have some uh, mechanism in place to assure uh, that awareness raising is uh, coherent or some trainings? Yeah, this, this is a very important topic. And uh, uh, we are already uh, reached the 1,000 uh, okay. employees limit and above. So um, we have dedicated uh, uh, capacity for uh, privacy and security awareness. So meaning people, the team working constantly on delivering the, the best possible experience for our employees when it comes to awareness. And specifically, we are integrating privacy and security awareness as a part of our employees development cycle, uh, personal development cycle. So. It, it doesn't mean that we, we have this kind of a baseline, you know, and, and we are um, providing these general uh, security and privacy trainings. We have these very specific targeted groups in the company where we target those groups with a specific user case, uh, use cases, specific awareness material, um, training material, uh, even games. We, we, for example, Security Month is coming up uh, on October, so we will have these Capture the Flag games where everybody can be involved and so on and so on. So we are really trying to make security and privacy a part of our daily daily business, a part of our you know, personal development plans. We are spending a lot, uh, so, so much resources into, in, into bringing that on the agenda. 
Um, but also, like on another side, AI as well as cybersecurity are hot topics. Um, when we talk about AI, or let's also call it machine learning, um, it will be more frequently used by different kind of companies to uh, uh, better be better performing and or to enhance cons consumer views and to get a better marketing view or something. What do you consider as the challenges uh, in terms of AI related to cybersecurity? Yeah, uh, true thing actually. An algorithm was capable of identifying patterns and learning are widely used in cybersecurity. In a regular size company, uh, thousands of events are generated per minute uh, from the network and applications. And humans simply can't spot anomalies in those millions of lines. So machinery code is and, and capabilities are irrepla irreplaceable, I would say. The same widely discussed zero trust concept is uh, moving towards uh, an identity centric approach. We have heard zero tolerance in risk management. For example, we do not tolerate any bribery or threat to human safety. Following the same principle, uh, we can understand uh, zero trust. The proof is uh, needed, not only the illusion of faith. Uh, for such control mechanisms to work smoothly, machine learning and artificial intelligence solutions are inevitable. Uh, we see a market trend moving towards invisible security, if you can call it so, but there is tremendous work behind the scenes done by these artificial intelligence algorithms and machines. But the, the, the challenge starts when malicious actors use the same high tech uh, technology. In that case, it is uh, complement complicated to protect. So um, the algorithm is fighting the algorithm, uh, if you can call it so. Teams are working on improving the technology capable of uh, detecting and responding to threat. And those fights are invisible, but very important. And still most of the targeted attacks are precisely made uh, human theater, you can call it so. But I believe fight between fights between artificial intelligence are the future. Okay, thank you very much for your views. And finally, we would uh, like to ask you like a final question. And it's, uh, as we've said, like uh, with your uh, 50 million customers, uh, 15 countries, over 1,000 employees, uh, what are the challenges that Vinted is facing to keep growing? Yeah, so uh, I, I know that I'm holding you, uh, uh, you know, uh, before the lunch break. So I I will keep that short. And um, there are a few challenge, challenging areas. I would I would say one is the technology itself. As I have mentioned previously, we are growing to the size. Just imagine our um, image storage, for example, where we reach um, the limit of existing technology and need to innovate. It is a very encouraging challenge so nothing wrong with that but the challenge we face as a business on a mission to make second hand the first choice worldwide is fast fashion every one of 500 fashion items is bought in vintage in europe now and we want to make it one from two so it's a huge huge road ahead of us Thank you very much for all these insights, but uh, you're not ready to uh, go already to lunch. You will uh, stay a little bit further with us because we are complimenting uh, this session uh, and we're inviting Stefan Umit Uygur, who is CEO of Four Securitas, to pitch his business ideas. And Thomas um, will assist his presentation to share his view with them right after his five minutes pitch. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Stefan, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> okay, so you have five minutes for your business pitch. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, good morning. My name is Stefan. Uh, I am the CEO for Securitas, a Dublin, Ireland based uh, cybersecurity uh, company. We are uh, developing Axia. Axia is uh, 
uh, host-based, host-automated cyber defense solutions is, uh, is an automated cybersecurity intelligence uh, application. The, the innovativeness and the difference, the difference between Axia and the existing technologies is that our technologies are primarily focused on proactive cyber defense aspect. Um, I'll try to explain that very, very briefly, since only we have only five five minutes uh, five minutes time. So, uh, in the current technologies, current uh, vendors, they tend to focus all uh, on on the uh, reactive aspect of of the cyber attacks, so meaning. Uh, the technologies are designed primarily when there is an attack in progress, when there is an attack uh, happening, they are, they, are, they are designed to be triggered that, at that moment and try to you know, detect and mitigate a cyber attack. Uh, that's actually uh, based on my uh, experience. Uh, of I, I'm, I'm over two decades now into the cybersecurity industry. It's, it's uh, based on my, it's too late to, you know, to, to intervene, to deal with the, the mitigate. You have a very, very a tiny little uh, <laughs> chance of mitigating of detecting that type of attack. When I talk about the proactive uh, cyber defense, uh, I refer to when there is no attack. So our technology is not, is designed for reactive uh, cyber defense as well. I mean, uh, it triggers as a traditional cybersecurity solution when there is an attack in progress. However, as I said, it's primary focus. It focuses on indicator of, you know, attacks. So when uh, any type of uh, any cybersecurity attack starts, with information gathering and reconnaissance phase. There is no other way to perform an attack in a cybersecurity, in a to perform an attack in a target in an industry if you have not collected information, if you have not collected enough information and you have not done information gathering and reconnaissance phase. Therefore, you have enough information on that target, in, targeting infrastructure and you know where to attack. Okay, so we focus on that phase. Um, as uh, based on my knowledge, even though the technologies, they claim that they do that as well, there is no technology that they focus on information gathering and reconnaissance, meaning information gathering and reconnaissance phase are harmless. They're not, nobody's attacking. They're just collecting information that deliberately is provided by servers, by you know, firewalls, by routers. They're, they're publicly provided. Okay, so uh, the, the the potential attacker is collecting an information that is publicly available. Okay, it's a, like a, the the scanning of ports, you know, uh, the protocols, the versions, the applications, the platforms, the news, the technology, and therefore they can uh, having all this information. They can collect the information about vulnerability, where are the vulnerabilities, and prepare the exploit or get the relevant exploit, and then compromise, break into the system, and introduce their their malicious software. Even in case of receiving an email with the links. You know, if you uh, have noticed, typically a manager or an employee receives a perfect template of an email. You know, it's very credible with the highly credible content. And that's the reason uh, that most of, most of the time, that was the reason that the, the employee or the C-level management, they click on the link that is provided because the content is credible. So how did they know much about you? How did they know what's your role? How did they know what's your position in the company? How did they, how did they get all that information and then ultimately dispatch an email to you with the link expecting for you to click? They did the information gathering and reconnaissance phase. So the majority of cyber uh, attacks, actually, um, it happens when the attack is in progress, when the attack is occurring, it's actually too late. They have already collected enough information on your infrastructure that they can attack. If your system is, uh, your cyber defense solution is has detected them, mitigated, they will find another way to get in because they already planned, they already made their plans. Uh, your system is detected, then they will learn your system. They will try to work around the bypass it. Our technology, Axia, focuses on when you start to collect the information from the stage one, from the step one. When you start to ping the server, you knock the door. Imagine, uh, imagine a bank robbery. Okay, I will just try to give an, an analogy. Uh, a bank robbery doesn't just happen over the night. Just a, 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 um, a criminal, they just they don't just walk into a bank. Hey. Uh, stop everyone, this is a bank robbery. They don't say that. They study the bank for weeks, if not for months, okay? A cyber attack is exactly the same. So they have to study for weeks, 
if not for months, and then attack solar winds attacks, you know, uh, the pipeline, the, the, the colonial pipeline, the, you know, the most important was just to say, uh, uh, Lazio region in Italy, HSE system in Ireland, they were all started day with, they studied uh, you know, uh, um, entirely the, 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 the targets, the infrastructure, they found the vulnerability and then they performed, they did all their job. So our technology focuses on that phase. It's a very, very simple technology, but yet very effective and efficient. Um, the, the, giving the, the, the trends of the cyber attacks and their success rate, you know, on the market, alarmingly increasing, that's clear indication that the existing cybersecurity solutions are not effective. Most of, most of the time they will say cyber attacks, hackers are one step ahead. That's not really true based on my experience. Based on my experience, the techniques are 25 years ago, they were always the same. The information gathering techniques, their reconnaissance techniques, they're always the same. The type of the data I will be looking for that will enable me to attack your infrastructure and break in is always the same data. I will be always Thank looking you. for the same data. Thank so you. Time is up already plan. over a minute. Yeah. I have to Thank break you. you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, it's already time is already up over a minute. Okay. So I'm sorry, sorry to, to cut you here. Um, Thomas, do you have any questions for Stefan? Yeah, a, a one maybe question. So I can simply just I can just agree with the with the idea that it's um, it's best to to have these preventive measures in place. To protect you from the from from the malicious actions coming to your part, but um, I think it's very important as well to understand how you guys are doing that. So, are you applying some kind of a sensors worldwide, and you are capable to detect these uh, anomalies? For example, that somebody starts digging into the employee of my company. Uh, you know, on, on social media, you know, maybe checking, maybe sending some just simple email to check in or or are you doing somehow it's um, in a centralized manner? So okay. your thoughts? Yeah, that part, not yet. We have in our roadmap to do like the social media, even dark web, you know, the, you know, OSINT, open source intelligent platform, I'm sure you know that. So that's, we intend to, it's in our roadmap, we intend to integrate in our technology. Right now, we are monitoring uh, devices, primarily servers, and also endpoints. So uh, for a attacker, for a potential attacker to get an information about your employee, it's business information we're talking about. So business information is always stays on the business asset. So your email stays on your mail server or your exchange server or whatever, wherever you host your email. And they're going to basically, they're going to query your mail server, okay? And your applications, your office, your role, your profile is on your HR server, is on your HR database, is on your you know, personnel and stuff and all that stuff. And the application, you know, the business application, they're going to study, they're going to build the whole, put the puzzle together. You know, so it's all actually in the business asset where we are monitoring, where our technology is connected and monitor where our clients, they buy our technology and they connect. So from the moment, again, the reason that no cybersecurity solution detect is because they're not attacks. They're just queries. They are just collecting information. They're saying, hey, can you tell me the uh, email uh, email of Thomas, of Thomas Mertinkenas, you know, and then he gets the email. Can you tell me, let me have a look what the Thomas exactly profile is. What's his role? He does this. And who is his boss? Who is his uh, subordinate? Who are his subordinates? Who is the team? Who is and then, it pro then they learn about this, but they collect all this information from your business asset. So we are able to capture all that queries, all this information. We do not allow them. So we do not allow them to, of course, collect all this information. When they collect, well, who is the Thomas first? And then they say, what's the Thomas role? And then uh, the third thing, we automatically know because there is no way an application around the world that's going to, if not for malicious uh, you know, intent, there is no other application is going to ask you such information all in sequence. You know? So we correlate this information. And then uh, this is just uh, you know, the, the intelligence, the, the, the user profile side. We have the, tech, the, you know, the exploit side that when they're targeting the servers and the technical part as well. So we, we correlate all this information and we stop them getting that information. The information is not fed anymore to them. We stop, we basically ban that IP address. When they change their IP address, they come back with another IP address they will have to do as well, of course, they're smart people. 
And they start from where they left. Technology knows already. They didn't start from the step one. They started from the step three. So it already knows that they already have done. So they stopped. It stopped. It stops them, literally stops them. It stops them getting that information that will enable them to send you an email or enable them to run a vulnerability scan on your infrastructure or enable them to run a payload. Okay, imagine um, um, uh, the, the technologies today, unfortunately, with, with no priority order priority, all technologies, all vendors, they focus on the niche problem, on the single problem. They focus on malware detection. But when the malware hits my server, it's already too late. I'm already compromised. They already studied, they already got in, they know how to, they found the work, right? they know everything about me. The, the, so the origin of the problem, the source of the problem is to not let anyone you know know collect, collect information about this is in, in the real world as well you know the banks the prisons you know what they do they 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 hide the information that you don't want to know their planning the how the bank is where is the cash is you know and uh, where is the alarm where is the guard you know all this information is is critical isn't it do you agree with me so uh, so we basically not uh, we we stop them getting that information once you stop them getting that information you are automatically stopping an attack. You're not, of course, we are not eliminating the whole you know, cyber attack world. Nobody can do that, of course. But we are very drastically, drastically diminishing, minimizing. So we're stopping the majority of you know, uh, common attacks, if not even sophisticated ones. We're stopping them before they become an attack, before they originate. So unfortunately, the cybersecurity industry needs, they needs to change. They need to switch to the proactive aspect. And you said you agree on this. No one, no one seems to focus on the proactive sorry, Stefan, aspect. I'm sorry, Stefan, I'm sorry, I will have to uh, cut you sorry. again. <laughs> we are out of, of time. Uh, I'm really sorry, but uh, thank you for your pitch. Uh, thanks also to Thomas for his contribution and for uh, his question to you. And um, yeah, I would like to- Thanks very much, Thomas. Thanks very much for your, for your question. And I hope we will have a, more in touch, more chat. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please feel free, okay? Thank you Thank very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks very much. Have a good one, Chip. Bye. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank everyone uh, for their attention. This concludes our morning session. And uh, we want to thank all the speakers that have participated this morning, whether it was here physically or remotely. Uh, we were very happy to welcome them today. So this afternoon, we will reconvene here at 2 p.m. Um, that next session will focus on AI threats and opportunities. And we also have a session post-quantum cryptography. Um, so enjoy your lunch break. And don't forget to visit the exhibition. Thank you, everyone, and see you at 2 p.m. <laughs>